There's about four theories. Fidel Castro, the mafia did it. Pentagon did it theory. I'm gonna tell your audience killed John Kennedy. We had him in a plan to kill Fidel Castro. On November 22nd, I was caught with my pants down when the same plan was used, but on John Kennedy. Can you kind of start at the beginning for people that don't know? So John Kennedy, it's 1963, he's campaigning. He's beginning the very early phases of campaigning for what's going to be the 1964 presidential election. He's in Texas, which at that year is going to be, you know, historically is, is a solidly democratic state. Right. The South as a whole is solidly democratic because- And he's, and he's running he's, as a Democrat. Right, he's a Democrat, but it's up in the air a little bit because he's making major moves on civil rights and the solid South, which was almost a one party state in democratic hands at the time is starting that it looks like that could, could wither, even though his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who's with him is from Texas. So he's down there knowing that that even then it was a high electoral vote count state. He's going to need Texas, or he's going to want to certainly hope to cinch it up in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and again, this is early in, in what we would call campaign season. Uh, but he's down there. He's gets off at Love Field. He and his wife get into a car with the governor of Texas, John Connolly. There's all sorts of internal uh, rivalries involving Lyndon Johnson, uh, Governor Connolly, Ralph Yarborough, stuff I won't go into, but all behind the scenes stuff. And he is in a motorcade and he is going to speak at an indoor event, but he's going through Dallas to get there, Dallas, Fort Worth. The car goes down Houston. Uh, it's November 22nd, 1963. It then makes a left onto Elm Street. Uh, anywhere from three to five shots, depending on your your shooting scenario, ring out in Dealey Plaza. And John Kennedy is wounded in his torso and in his head. John Connolly, who's sitting in front of him, also suffers, sustains wounds to his torso, his wrist, and his thigh. John, both of them are rushed to Parkland Memorial Hospital. It's around 1230 Central Standard Time. And while he's being treated, there is a obvious manhunt on to figure, to try and get whoever it is who killed the president. It's somewhat chaotic, as you might imagine. And Kennedy is eventually pronounced dead at Parkland Hospital. Governor Connolly survives. And while this is happening, the Dallas police eventually arrest, a couple hours later, arrest and apprehend a um, worker from a building that was on that parade route in Dealey Plaza, a worker from a building called the Texas School Book Depository named Lee Harvey Oswald, a former defector to the Soviet Union who had returned to the United States. Oswald is not only accused of killing John Kennedy, He's accused of killing a Dallas police officer, J.D. Tippett, who is alleged to have tried to arrest him along the way. And then Oswald stridently denies that he had anything to do with these killings. Uh, on TV, he says he's innocent and that he's just a patsy. But he, on his way to be arraigned for the crime two days later, so this was on Friday, November 22nd, is the killing. Sunday, November 24th, he's being taken out of the basement of the Dallas police building. A nightclub owner by the name of Jack Ruby pulls out from like a gaggle of reporters and police officers. And as Oswald is being escorted out, shoots Oswald in the stomach. Uh, Oswald will then die not long after from those wounds. And... That, for my father and my grandparents, was, and for many, many Americans, is what 
caused a lot of skepticism and doubt. You know, modern American political assassins in the United States typically admit to their crimes. They typically do it from short range, and they certainly don't get killed while they're denying the crime. So it leaves a taste in the mouth of a lot of Americans that there's something more here. Lyndon Johnson, who takes over as president, uh, is sworn in actually on Air Force One as they're taking the body of John Kennedy back to be autopsied in Maryland. Uh, he eventually orders a presidential commission to investigate the case. And several months later, in September of 1964, that commission, run by the Chief Justice Earl Warren, known as the Warren Commission, comes out with a conclusion that the person who was arrested and shot, Lee Harvey Oswald, was the lone deranged assassin. There was no conspiracy. He had no help in any way, shape, or form. And that is what many people refer to as the quote-unquote official version. But in fact, about 15 years later, the case is reopened by Congress because of many doubts that have circulated since that time, since 1963. And they actually concluded that there was a likely conspiracy. Um, so that I'll end it at that, but that's sort of the overview. Right. Okay. And since then, I mean, there have just been numerous conspiracy theories. Correct. So we've had hundreds of books written on this topic. I would imagine that if you get past the Civil War and World War II, it might be the most commented upon period of American history and books that we have. Um, and I've probably read 120 books on my own, um, besides going into the archives, going through files, going through documents, um, watching documentaries, even interviewing witnesses, going to conferences. Highly controversial event. It is a traumatic event for people like, again, my father never was, was a young, he was a 20 year old guy when this happened. He never got over it. Um, my grandparents never got over it. Many Americans never fully got over it um, and had answered questions. And of course, you hold up a president as in high esteem and he's killed at that young an age and you don't feel as if your government fully leveled with you. That's going to be an issue that a lot of people take an interest in. Yeah, well, political assassinations in the United States in general, but especially in the United States, where you feel like things are so stable is is really, you know, disheartening. <laughs> Let's right. say, you know, the one thing I always feel like about our government is that it's, you know, for all of the infighting, it's stable. They're not blowing up cars. They're not killing each other. They're not, you know, they're not, you know, having their political rivals arrested and thrown in prison, although, you know, the Trump thing yeah. might change that. But regardless, you know, that's I've always felt secure. So to, can you imagine like Kennedy, you know, love him or hate him at the time? My God, I mean, you know, that's just so I can't right. imagine anything less uh, democratic. Right. Well, there have been a couple of attempts since, uh, you know, Garfield was assassinated in a hundred years before, yeah, but then but in a exactly. span of 10 years, if like, again, I told my father's three heroes are John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy. Imagine having all three of them killed in a five year span. Oh yeah. You'd and have no say trust. Nothing of Malcolm X and other people, you know, um, Fred Hampton, etc. you know, who wouldn't have been on the radar of a lot of people, you know, Fred Hampton. But point is, is that we had a period of, of, you know, going from the 50s where you can talk about politically stable, it doesn't get any more stable than America in the 1950s to the 1960s, which, you know, I referred certainly to the second half of that decade. I would tell my students 65, 75, the age of social upheaval. And the assassination of Kennedy really kind of starts it at the end of 63. And really the decline of faith and trust in the American government you got to be careful with, you know, causation correlation, but it starts in 64. And, you know, we weren't headlong into Vietnam in 64. So the people who think that that was what caused it, what I think caused it is there were a lot of Americans who didn't believe their own government. 
uh, that on on the story of what happened to their president, and that only got larger as the decade went further, and as the decades went further. Right. So, what are some of the the theories? So, I'd argue that there's that there's about four theories that really get some currency. Um, one of which, you know, some of it depends on the nature of the people who investigate. Uh, the the theory that my father eventually settled on, and understand, my father was was liberal. My grandfather was an actual Marxist. Um, uh, they would get into to fights. See, my father was like an anti Marxist liberal, but my father eventually settled on on Fidel Castro having killed John Kennedy, and. I, I, I mentioned that it would be a, it's a theory that doesn't get a whole lot of currency in the community of people who research. And I'll explain why I don't think it gets enough credit. People are very quick to dismiss it. But the theory goes is that our government was trying to kill Fidel Castro. Right. Fidel Which is Castro, well documented. That's well documented. That's not right. a, for debate. And, 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 you know, one of the last attempts uh, certainly in the Kennedy administration, was actually a poison pen was handed to a potential, you know, insider within the Cuban government, literally like the day of John Kennedy's assassination. And for my father, when he learned that, um, and that this person was told that Bobby Kennedy personally approved of the plot, whether that's true or not, uh, my father became convinced that it was Fidel Castro, uh, that it was Oswald's connections to Castro, which we'll talk a lot about soon. And, you know, because ostensibly on the surface, at the very least, Castro was the accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald's sort of political idol. And so the idea is, is that Castro then said, you know what, at this point, I'm playing with fire. I'm going to kill them and get rid of their people before they get rid of me. And that was the last straw when he heard in the days leading up to that poison pen plot that he was that Bobby was behind it, that that secured it. That was that was my father's argument. Now, what a lot of people will say and, on a, you know, to some extent, I agree with it, which is Fidel Castro would never be crazy enough to kill John Kennedy because it would invite a guaranteed attack on Cuba and wipe out his regime. Uh, my father used to always point out, well, A, his life is on the line. If he believes that really and truly, doesn't have a whole lot to lose. And B, within the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you actually study it, the one person, along with Che Guevara and people in the Cuban government, who was willing to really ratchet things up and in a way that would have almost certainly resulted in the destruction of Cuba was Fidel. Like the, the rational figures were Khrushchev and Kennedy in 62 when we almost had a nuclear war. Castro right. was the one who behind the scenes was saying stuff that if, you know, people followed through probably would have resulted in a nuclear war. So that, but my argument to my father my counter argument, it's going to become more obvious to people when I talk about this in more depth later on, is it's one thing to be willing to take risks to preserve your own life. It's another thing to take unnecessary risks. And no one is smart as Fidel Castro. And remember, Fidel Castro outlived all the people who were trying to get rid of his regime. Every president who was trying to get rid of him, he outlived all of them. He's not going to use Lee Harvey Oswald, who has, as we will talk about, open affinity for Fidel Castro to kill John Kennedy, right? Because you don't have to, you know, say invade my island. You could use Castro infiltrated anti-Castro groups. He could have any one of those people do it and shifted the blame away. So in other words, I don't think he would have used Oswald to pull it off. That's why I dismiss Fidel Castro. Um, but that is one of the theories that still sometimes gets tossed about, but it's not very well, doesn't have a lot of currency. 
Um, relatedly, and one that gets a lot more currency, I would especially say in mainstream circles, is the mafia killing yeah. John Kennedy. Right. And the argument there is twofold. And it actually connects back to Fidel Castro. The twofold argument is one, no attorney general before and certainly since, or I should say, certainly before and arguably since, uh, beyond Bobby Kennedy has ever done more to try and crack down on the mafia. It was almost a non existent priority before Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy made it the priority of the Justice Department. He was despised by people in organized crime and adjacent groups like Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters. And so the, the argument goes in this front that they killed John because killing John would make sure that Bobby loses any influence because Lyndon Johnson also hated Bobby Kennedy, the new president. The other element to the mafia argument is, is that the mafia also had ex enormous financial interests in Cuba that were lost when Fidel Castro took over in a communist revolution and nationalized everything and got rid of the casino industry, basically. And so the mafia wanted those that island back. And a lot of people, as I'll get to in a little bit, a lot of people thought that Kennedy was wishy-washy on the issue of getting rid of Castro. Um, so and then there's a third, which I think is a, a bit more controversial. It, it's almost accepted as common wisdom. But when you look at it, which is the argument that the mafia killed Kennedy because they helped him get elected and they felt betrayed. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into that, but I think if people actually look into the details – they'll find that that's weaker, a weaker rendition of what actually happened um, than people. It's almost taken at like face value now, and it shouldn't be. Either way, they clearly had a, mo a motive to kill him. And it ties in very nicely to the guy who killed John, killed Oswald, Jack Ruby, who was a nightclub owner who, he wasn't a made man, but he clearly had ties to organized crime, groups like the Teamsters. He had weird movements and associations and visits in the weeks leading up to the assassination. And so a lot of the mafia did it theory is rooted one in that motivation that I'm talking about. And two, in the fact that Jack Ruby kills Oswald. Many people think it was silencing Oswald and therefore his ties to organized crime feed into that motive that organized crime hated Bobby, wanted John and Bobby gone, hence they kill him. So that's sort of the second major theory, the mafia did it theory. Right. Um, then there's a Pentagon did it theory. And the argument there goes, or national security state, the, the argument there goes that, A, they thought John Kennedy was a sissy when it came to communism. These people, and, and this is not an exaggeration if you see the movie 13 Days about the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the period of time we came closer to a nuclear war than just about any in American history. And, you, you know, you, you, any outsider nowadays looks back at that and says, wow, thank God John Kennedy figured out how to ease the tensions there so we didn't get into a nuclear war. But the, the there were people in the Pentagon who not only wanted to invade Cuba knowing there would be a nuclear war, right? they actually thought we could win a nuclear war. And their, 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 their mindset was, we'll kill 100 million of them, they'll kill 30 million of us, and we win. And it right. sounds nuts, but these people... <laughs> Were, were were nuts. I don't say that lightly. I'm a, his, they were border like they were borderline psychopaths, right? Um, they despised Kennedy. They thought he chickened out at the Bay of Pigs in 1961 when he wouldn't give air support. They thought that he had 
wussed out in the Cuban Missile Crisis and should have invaded. They things that were like symbolic that he did, like talk about going and you know doing a joint space program with the Soviets. They freaked out about that. Um, well, he signed I think, a nuclear test ban treaty. They freaked out about that. I, Go ahead. I, I think um, you know the Bay of Pigs things thing. You know he definitely he definitely dropped the ball there. I mean, in my opinion, I you know I've I've read a couple of books about it. I feel like he should have sent in an air missile report. I really think he let those guys get slaughtered. But and and then as far as the um um the Cuban Missile Crisis, like I think he he made the right call. Like I mean, it, late especially later on, finding out they had active you know, the, the ability to have active nukes and they had what shoulder nukes. They had a bunch of things that we didn't realize they had, like that would have gone nuclear. Like, I think he made the right call. Oh, a hundred percent. And right. and we know even more so now because we know from when, when the Soviet union fell after the cold war in 1991, we get access to their people and their archives. And we know, you know, even from cruise ships, like grandchildren and stuff, like the pressure on his side, he had what we would call right wingers there. And if you did some of the stuff that was being proposed, especially by these Pentagon folks in the XCOM meetings, the meetings that John Kennedy organized to try and, you know, talk through and, you know, game plan out what to do in the in the Cuban Missile Crisis, if we had done what they had wanted. It, it would have absolutely escalated into a nuclear right. exchange. And, and what did we give up? We gave up some nuclear we weapons that were antiquated, that were no good anyway, that were, you know, scheduled to be taken down. Like, so what? Right. So you dropped, you know, two dozen of uh, uh, nukes that were really just not not going to make a difference anyway. Right. And, and I, I mean, you don't it doesn't I have things that I, I take a very realistic view, as we'll hear in this conversation about John Kennedy. I don't I don't throw him on a, a mythical mountain. But you can make a very serious argument, A, that he saved the world, and right. B, you know, it's very difficult. I'm a big-time presidential historian, but, you know, it's like with sports, it's very difficult to say, you know, if, if uh, you know, Babe Ruth were on the Red Sox and stayed on the Red Sox instead of going to the Yankees, you know, would he have hit 40 home runs? You're, you're dealing with counterfactuals. Is somebody, right. like, a really great president, or did he do – what every president would have done. This is a rare example of where you could actually say, no, we are very lucky John Kennedy was the guy there. Because at one point, if you look at the people who were invited to that meeting, several of those people either ran for president or could have run for president. And they were proposing things that would have led to a nuclear war. So it's, he held his ground when other people who we would have maybe had in his place did not. Yeah, so we luckily, were very lucky very, he was the guy in place at that time. He was very pragmatic. Right. Luckily, and and luckily. that's, by the way, is going to become a huge discussion as we go forward. That's where I think people overstate how great or not great he was. More than anything, he was pragmatic. Um, But – a group of people who hated him at the time and who did things even during the missile crisis that were provocative that they really should not have done. Any common person with common sense would not have done unless you wanted to force John Kennedy's hand would be the senior leaders uh, at, at the Pentagon. And the sort of the very common argument for this Pentagon did it theory is to make an argument based on John Kennedy in Vietnam. And for people who don't know him, Vietnam was in its very, very early phases, the Vietnam War at this point in time. We basically had Green Berets there. It was advisors. And there's a real debate um, as to what John Kennedy would have done. But, you know, the, the people in this debate, they sometimes, you know, you know, whether he was definitively going to pull out of Vietnam or not, and I certainly don't think he was going to expand the if he could avoid it the involvement there if you're looking at it from the perspective of did the pentagon do something to try and get rid of him you have to take what their mindset is going to be 
And this is the guy who over and over again in their minds, and this is documented, gave in in their minds to the communists. And now he's going to pull out of Southeast Asia. So he's um, going to give them Southeast Asia also. Right. In their minds, he's the, he, he's practically a communist, right, for, for right. doing this kind of – that's the, that's the argument. And so – there is some evidence that a policy that he had circulated, a memorandum, National Security Act Memorandum 263, which was certainly calling for at least the initial phases of what could become a full withdrawal, was circulating right before he got killed. And right after he got killed, it gets changed in a substantive way that doesn't allow for a pullout. And so the, the, the Pentagon did it. People really focus on that um, because the changes, the, the ingredients for the substantive change, they argue, were in place before John Kennedy got killed. And if assuming that that memorandum was supposed to represent his honest opinions on Vietnam, who, why would you, who thought they could change it and get away with it? And how would you think you could get away with it? The argument is, oh, well, they, they know they're going to knock him off. Yeah. Right? And so, the, but, and there is some, again, there, there's, you know, A, they certainly had motive means and opportunity with, you know, equivalent of whatever kind of special forces you could have mustered for that period of time. And they do have a military connection to Oswald. Oswald served in the Marines for people who think that he never stopped being a military intelligence agent. We'll get to that in a little bit. The argument is, is that they, they manipulated him somehow, turned him on John Kennedy, and they did it because they thought Kennedy was going to cave to the communists, both in Cuba, where they asked the other thing that's going on, and I'll get to our very next theory – is that John Kennedy, the pragmatist, while his administration, I think this gets mythologized, was absolutely working behind the scenes to try and undermine the Castro regime to the point of trying to topple it, uh, was also simultaneously making secret backroom overtures to Castro, starting in September of 1963. That, we have good reason to think that leaked out. And that would absolutely freak out the people in the Pentagon also. The problem is, is it, it, A, you've got to get me to people who could get to Oswald. I'll get to this when we get further into my own theory. You really have to get me to people who can get to Oswald in the months leading up to the assassination. And there's not a whole lot of evidence of military Pentagon interaction with Oswald at that time at all, in my opinion. Um, and then the second thing is any kind of super high level plot, you're taking huge risks of it being leaked. Mm -hmm. um, and these people, you know, when whenever we give these theories, we often look at what they have to gain and we don't look at what they have to lose. They would have been executed for treason if they got caught. Like they have a lot to lose. So but at the very least, you're going to spend the rest of your life in, in federal prison, right? In a, so, in a box somewhere. Right. I'm willing to entertain the, the pending. This is what I mean. I'm waiting on some authors. There's a author who I'll mention probably more than once. His name is John Newman. He himself spent years in military intelligence and national security agency. And he's brilliant. Um, but, and he's clearly working towards, that kind of argument and has been sort of most of the way there for the last 30 years. And I'm willing to give him a chance to lay it out. Um, and the only problem is he, every time he, he's super thorough and he's been taking his books on multi-volume books on the Kennedy assassination year by year. And he's only on 62 and every like three months he gets diverted on like another book on another topic that's related, but not really directly related to the Kennedy assassination. So I don't know if we're going to see his pure Kennedy assassination book until like 2028 or something. Right. Um, 
and I, and and tentatively, I'm I, for the reasons I mentioned, I'm I'm deeply skeptical, which brings me broadly to a theory that we'll keep on coming back to, and it actually combines elements of some of what we've been talking about, which is the anti-Castro forces writ large, which includes, by the way, the mafia, who the CIA had recruited into Castro assassination plots. Um, It includes the anti-Castro exiles, the people who after Castro takes over in Cuba, flee to the United States uh, and are still very much heavily concentrated in places like Miami. And who want to take back the island, and they're the people who feel betrayed at the Bay of Pigs. I will quickly say as an aside in the Bay of Pigs, the one thing I'll say for John Kennedy, it is very obvious, and this gets to the third group of people in that umbrella, um, the subset of CIA people who are involved in anti-Castro operations. It's very clear Kennedy inherited the Bay of Pigs from Eisenhower and Nixon, the previous administration. And the CIA, and this is documented in in reports from internal reports from the CIA that have been released in the last decade. They knew that this was a, a plot that was very unlikely, the Bay of Pigs operation, the invasion, was very unlikely to work. And they neglected to inform John Kennedy of that fact. Um, they, they knew it had been compromised, like that Castro had informants inside the exile community. They knew that they likely weren't going to get the spontaneous invasion in Cuba that they were predicating this all on. And essentially, essentially they set him up to force his hand to commit air power. If John Kennedy commits air power, remember this was a covert operation. It was supposed to be done in a way that America could at least claim, I you know, I think many people would find it silly even at the time, but they could at least claim that the official government of the United States had nothing to do with it. Plausible deniability. But if John Kennedy has to commit error, there's there's no denying that we're officially supporting it. And then you're dealing with a violation of international law during the Cold War. The United States invading a sovereign country. So um, he, there's definitely a lot of Cuban exiles who were also betrayed. But I, I, I would argue that they were betrayed by the people above them in the, in the CIA more than they were by John Kennedy. But the mid-level agents, this is really important for the, where we're going to go. The mid-level people who would never be in the room with John Kennedy you know, and telling him, debriefing him on the future plans and who had very close personal ties to these exiles who they trained, who had given them assurances and who did not know that John Kennedy was set up in any way, shape or form, absolutely blamed John Kennedy and were absolutely radicalized by the failure to provide air support. And when you add those three groups up together, the exiles, the mid-level CIA people, and the and the mafia types involved in anti-Castro operations, we'll come back to it, but that I think is the theory that has probably had the most currency in the Kennedy assassination community amongst people who are rational. There's all sorts of people who are way out there in my opinion, but that, that would be those four theories overall and that theory in particular. Okay. So what is, what's the theory that you feel after researching is the most likely or that you are leaning toward? Okay, so I'm going to tease your audience a little bit, and I'll work my way up to where where I go. I'm going to tell your audience that I think James Bond killed John Kennedy. And I obviously mean that in a metaphorical sense. 
And I'm going to say this in, in, in two broad strokes, and then I'll give you all the details. First off, my general approach to true crime, period, um, and my general, you know, sort of approach to history in many ways is your, your goal is to explain the strongest pieces of data, the strongest data points, uh, as many as you can with the least amount of speculation. And this does involve an element of speculation to it. But I think it weaves things together. It's relatively simple. Um, and it certainly explains the strongest data points. And the one the data points that I find most important to explain, and that is going to be sort of the focus of my discussion, are those that involve Lee Harvey Oswald. And the reason for that, there's, there's a real point of logic to it, which goes like this. No matter what you think Lee Harvey Oswald's role was on November 22nd, 1963, it's all but impossible to imagine a scenario where understanding him and what he's doing in the days and months leading up to the Kennedy assassination isn't the key to understanding what happened. And the reason is no one is going to be able – is going to – set somebody up for a crime, first of all, they have to be able to set that person up. They have to be in a position to set them up. And they really have to be in a position to manipulate their their movements. Because if you don't, what happens if Lee Harvey Oswald is uh, in lunch with 20 people? Right. Now, now, there's some of that that actually comes up. But the point is, is you got to make sure that he doesn't have an airtight alibi even if he has nothing to do with the shooting, right? But of course, if he has something to do with the shooting, whether he's a pure lone nut or whether you, you know, my father always thought that Castro's people put him up to doing it by himself. Um, either way, you got to be in a position to influence his actions. Right. What is the likelihood that a, uh, a staunch supporter of communism who's gone to the Soviet Union, stayed there, become disenfranchised, comes back, is still inter- is still a supporter of communism, you know, loves Castro, loves the idea of it, ends up in the working in the Texas Depository building was also in the military and is a, and and um, you know, can fire a weapon obviously. Um you know, is there like what are the odds that there happens to be this guy that works there on that floor in that building on that day? And Kennedy's route is, I, I believe, was changed at the last minute to go by the is am I wrong about that? So that's a tricky, door? that's a tricky matter. Um right. It, it, you know, we know how, where he was intended to go, and, and that, that was fairly set in stone. How you specifically get there is a little bit tricky, but here's the thing, to your point, and worth, and it's, you astutely bring it up. Um, anybody who knew, and you would have known September of 1963, that Kennedy was going to take a visit to Dallas, if you had done any kind of background, you would have known the general route he would have taken. So you had two months where what you would have done if you were if you were trying to plot to kill him is get somebody who you either were tending to set up or actually fire on John Kennedy in some building along the route. And what a lot of people don't know, and my co-author on my King assassination books, Killing King, has written what I think are the best books on the Kennedy assassination, even has a free series of essays online uh, called Tipping Point on a site called Mary Farrell. Um, He did a great job in some of his early books in showing that Lee Harvey Oswald is applying for other jobs, and they all happen to be along that route. Hmm. Right? So – it you know people seem to think that this had to be intricately planned for months on end you just need to get people you know and if 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 you have to take 2 weeks to plan every ambush military history would be very very different 
You just need to have people who are sitting on go ready to be where once you find out within two hours of where John Kennedy is actually going to go, you just need to have people able to be there with guns. Right. Um, it's happened God knows how many times in military history where the, the ambush is planned at the last minute. Um, you know, so you're absolutely right. What are the odds that Oswald, I would say a little bit there, I'd say, what are the odds that Oswald is applying for jobs, you know, four or five jobs along what everybody would have known the parade route was once you knew he was visiting Dallas for a general purpose. Um, so I think that's very significant. Um, now I'll return to that real quick. The other, uh, you know, element of it is, is to the bond theory as we'll see, and I won't talk about it much is from actually our government's angle and really from John Kennedy's angle. The one thing John Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald shared in common, they were both obsessive James Bond fans. Okay. Right? And we'll talk about it in the case of John Kennedy, that comes with an affinity for like covert operations that I think gets well played down by people who want to put him on a pedestal, um, especially from the left. Uh, Oswald, he's since he was a boy, he was obsessed with the the cloak and dagger. His favorite show was I Led Three Lives. Um, he obsessively read James Bond books and other spy novels. And so you actually give a great entry point to where I'm going to start with in taking me to my theory, because you bring up what are the odds that this pro Castro, you know, one time Soviet defector is going to be on the parade route. Well, if you say that in the research community that I'm a part of, many, many people will say, oh, that's because he never really was pro Castro and pro Soviet. He was an agent of, or a source or an asset for the American intelligence community. And there, you know, I'll get back to this when I talk about the importance of viewing Oswald on his own terms with his own agenda. But there is a case to be made. Uh, and it goes back to Oswald and the military and Oswald's defection. So Oswald joins the military underage in the late 1950s. Um, people give different reasons for it. His mom was overbearing for sure. His brother did it, so he may have been influenced by it. Some people say he might have been put up to it by intelligence shadowy types. Uh, he goes into the military and it's not long before he starts to visibly show an interest in all things Russia and Soviet. And he had, there's some evidence that he was already interested in communism as a teenager. It's the other thing. He's interested in spy stuff and he had a pa interest in political theory. But, you know, I'm sure the audience members and maybe the younger ones, the way to think about this right now is imagine if somebody, maybe Russia now, but uh, if somebody was showed an interest in Al-Qaeda when they were in the Marines, what that would be like. You're, you're talking code red to the 10th power if that happens. And that did not happen to Lee Harvey. So that's that's red flag number one is the guy is, is receiving like Russian records, has Russian... Books, his friends call him Comrade Oswaldovich. Everybody knows this guy is dabbling in all things Russia, and nobody seems to do anything to temper or mitigate against it. This is the Marines. This is the most gung-ho version in the of, of our military, even now, during the height of the Cold War. He studies the Russian language, takes a Russian test. Um, again, no evidence of anything happening to him. He's doing this 
for part of the time while he's serving at a military base in Japan, Atsugi, Japan. Two things about that base. It houses the U-2 spy plane, which is our most sensitive piece of spy equipment at the time. Now, Oswald only had a peripheral connection to that plane. I think it sometimes gets overstated. But it also was a major, and this is only recently known, it's a major sort of nuclear security area. Super important to intelligence community types and stuff. And they're letting this guy just run around, talk about communism and, you know, reading Russian and study Russian with no at least obvious sign. Well, is he pushing that um, agenda or is he just taking an interest because, well, hey. he's, he's taking an interest. He's okay. with a couple of the people he's close to. He's much more open about, for instance, what Castro is doing in Cuba, which is the Cuban revolution at the time. Um, but it's pretty clear that, that there should have been at least awareness. I mean, this is a guy who got in trouble for other things like insubordination, but did not get in trouble for that. For at least some people, it raises red flags. Then he defects, having lied about his reason for needing to take leave. And that's a, so, that's a big red flag, by the way. Right. <laughs> Unless he's legitimately <laughs> Marxist, right? So, is was his was his defection to the Soviet Union motivated by this intense interest he's developed in communism and and Russian culture, or was he recruited as some kind of spy? Now, which, people, I was going to say, which you know, by the way, I've I've interviewed a former CIA, you know, agent. So right. Uh, you know, and he explains that, you know, he was in the military when they came to him and said, listen, you've got an aptitude based on your tests, based on these types of things. You have an aptitude like we'd like to talk to you about this, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if you were recruited, they could have very easily recruit you and then allow you to kind of, you know, give you an assignment. And then because this guy, he went to other countries and he'd go and he'd be like a factory worker like during the day I work in a factory. Right. You know, like and not for like not for like 2 weeks. We're talking months and months and months, 6 months whatever to try and slowly infiltrate, you know, drug organizations or mm -hmm. you know other, you know, uh, let's say the upper echelon of that society's um government whatever, you know. So it's to p use him as a spy to slip into the Soviet Union you know, is, is very reasonable, especially if he's already got an interest, you know, and they don't realize his interest is, Hey, I'm a fan of this ideology, well, you know, which maybe it wasn't. You're astute. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're going to get to that in a second, actually. Well, or maybe more than a second, but that particular thought process you just had is going to be real important to my theory of, of what happened actually. Um, now, so let me add some red flag, additional red flags for that, you know, and some of them are pretty darn big. Um, he seems to have money and he's not a wealthy person. His family's very working class. He goes on his, on his way to defect. He goes from, you know, staying at, you know, mundane motels to going to randomly in the middle of his stay in Finland, staying at one, like a five star, right? He goes the way he defects. He gets into Russia really quickly, right? And a lot of people in the past have said, well, that's a sign that the Soviets have hooked him up and that maybe he's working for the KGB. Um, early on in the Kennedy assassination, that was a pretty popular theory. Except in the last 20 years, we found out something very interesting. Oswald happened to have gone to and through for his visa to get into the Soviet Union. He happened to go through a particular, I think it was in Helsinki, uh, embassy that we had set up through a our own turncoat within the KGB who worked out of their, you know, embassy foreign service there. The CIA had actually set up a system 
to get expedited visas for people through that guy, right? And that particular, you know, passing point, so to speak. So all the places Lee Harvey Oswald happens to go to get into the Soviet Union, that's where he goes. Isn't right. that a coincidence? Yeah. What are the odds? Um, he gets in. He goes to the embassy there um, to renounce his citizenship. And he does not fully give it up. But one thing he does do is all but announce, and all these places are bugged to the hilt. He all but announces that he's willing to trade military or whatever information he has to the Soviets when right. he goes in to talk to the American embassy there to basically announce, tell them that he's now going to be a citizen of the Soviet Union. Uh, and, you know, again, red flag for a lot of people. It sounds like he's putting on a show for these folks and specifically so that the KGB would become interested in him. There's some interesting stuff. The, the pers people at that embassy, the guy he talks to, is a you know we find out later was a career CIA guy. That's now that's not necessarily surprising. Those places were filled with them. Right. Um, he goes out of there, and he's trying his damnedest to get the Soviets to like fully acknowledge him, give him citizenship, set him up, and. He's, they're suspicious, and we know this from their files, they're suspicious of him, too. Like, isn't, you know, the same kind of things I'm telling you now are making them suspicious. He gets so frustrated with it that at least according to the official version, he attempts suicide. And what the Soviets say is, is they play along to some extent because of that. They get him a job at a radio factory in Minsk. And he sets up shop there, works there. He has a pretty, you know, decent lifestyle as an American defector there. Now, they claim, and that's and this is not believable either, that they never bothered to debrief him or find out what he knew. That's a lot of poppycock. Right. But he eventually uh, marries a Russian wife, a Soviet wife by the name of Marina Oswald. He becomes disenchanted with the Soviet Union, and he comes home. Again, now, a bunch of red flags. We actually loan him the money to come back. We, According to the official version, we never bothered to open a conventional file on him at the CIA for months on end, even though, again, they knew he was in the file on him, that he had threatened to give away secrets. Right. They and never did. did okay. And was talking about denouncing his citizenship. Like, I'm not sure this is a guy that you'd be lending money to to come <laughs> back. Right. Coming back, by the way, with a with a with a Soviet wife. Right. Right. Um, and then add in, according to the official version, we certainly have no records that they ever bothered to do any kind of damage assessment at in Japan or any of the other military places, but they would have certainly done it in Japan when he defected in the first place. So, like, you want to know, okay, did they... Even though he was a low-level guy, you want to right. know if he interacted with anybody who was high-level. Maybe he was part of a cell. No evidence that they investigated that. Instead... Yeah, at least have a conversation. Right. Instead, a couple of years later, they loan him the money to come back with a Soviet wife. And even though suspiciously... She comes, she gets her visa to leave in record time. Now that's from the Soviet end, and that's leads some to wonder about her affiliations. According to the official version, we did not debrief him when he came back. The intelligence agencies understand right. that if you took a business trip to the Soviet Union in 1959 for a week and came back, you were debriefed, right. Thousands and thousands of people are debriefed. This guy lived there for a year, threatened to give away secrets. And at least according to the official version, and we have reasons to doubt it, he wasn't debriefed on the way back. Um, for a lot of people, these are all red flags. And what the other thing we know now is that his files over in the 
CIA side are being treated in a completely unique and odd way relative to other people in the normal process of things. And by what I mean by that is we know how files get routed when the CIA starts reporting on somebody and they're getting routed to places that are very unusual, the places like the counterintelligence groups in the CIA. Now, I laid out all that case. Right. There's one big issue is that you're dealing with somebody who is literally only 20 years old. He was and 20? He's only 20. How long was he in the Soviet Union for? He was in the Soviet Union. He defe- I should say he defected when he was 20. Okay. He's in the Soviet Union for about two years. Wow, that's, that's, that is and, significant. And, 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 and like, this is what I would love to ask your friend. I only know from my own experience, I was a teacher. I taught students of all levels, but I taught students who went to Harvard and eventually sold companies to Google, right? right. Super mature, very bright kids. I would not trust them on a super top secret mission to infiltrate the Soviet Union at 20 years old, you know, a year or two after they graduated. I would not put my faith in them at that point. You need maturity to live that life. Right. The other issue um, is if he did this, he is like a Daniel Day Lewis level of becoming the character. And because everything from his writings to his interactions with his friends to places he goes, and I'm not talking just in the Soviet Union, I'm talking about in the years as we'll discuss when he comes back. They're all indicative of someone who at least in his own mind is a leftist. Right, he's all in. And now it's important to understand, he I don't think he even, I'm not sure he even graduated high school, right? And and many a smart person hasn't graduated high school, but he's not studying, my point is he's not studying political theory like he's Angela Davis at, you know, the University of Munich here. So what he thinks about what communism is and what leftism is and what socialism is, may not be what, you know, again, what, you know, Angela Davis and Bernie Sanders understand it to be. Right. right. But it's still not, you know, you if you would it, I actually, earlier today, I put it into a chat GPT because he wrote a whole little, this is my ideal utopia out. And I asked the chat GPT to give me the political theory that most closely matches. And it was something called anarcho syndicalism which is sort of like a leftist version of anarchy, neither here nor there. My point is, I know somebody who studied people who were like long-term moles. Right. And they break character. They always break character. It's impossible to not have moments where there are notable people in your life who are like, yeah, I think this guy might be working for somebody he does there's a big inconsistency here you're saying at some point there are cracks in the in the uh, right um, and this guy's doing it in all sorts of things like why would you ever think that something you typed in 1962 is gonna be read a year later right so those two things make me highly doubtful that he was an official agent of intelligence assets Right. But there is a middle ground, and it's actually consistent with some of this weird stuff with his files, which is suppose they did become interested in his pro-communist activities in the Soviet Union and when he was in Japan and the Philippines and California, and suppose they started watching him. Suppose they found out from a source that he actually is talking about defecting to the Soviet Union. Well – you may actually facilitate his defection. And the, and the reason is, is you, the reason we don't have a damage assessment after is because they did the damage assessment under this, and this is highly speculative, they did this damage assessment before. Right. They realized he wasn't any threat, that he had barely anything to provide on the U-2, but they maybe wanted to see if 
the Soviets bit on what Oswald had to offer, then maybe they didn't have much on the U-2. So you facilitate his defection through cutouts. You let him defect. And the reason you get him back, I guess, is sort of a – you could probably figure out some way of getting information on him without even debriefing him. And that's more valuable to – after a few months – of him not being anybody in the Soviet Union, that's probably a lot more valuable to you than him being over there as some sort of well, facilitated you, defector. So, are you saying that Oswald said he was never def- he was never debriefed, or you're saying there's no proof of it? Because so the CIA claimed in official documents to this day that they never debriefed him. There but, is there what is that, um, what does that mean? Well, like the, the the lack of if you're debriefing every single businessman that comes back from the from there and you don't debrief him, the fact that there is no debriefing is tantamount to there being some type of a cover up. I mean, at the very least, you would do I do a, a I do a three a, a three paragraph, you know, FBI 302 saying, oh, we talked to the guy. He doesn't know anything. He so. So they sent. So here's an interesting thing. First of all, incredibly astute. So John Newman, the guy who I mentioned before, who was an intelligence analyst for years, right? That was one of his core claims. Like the red flag is the very fact that they would claim something so absurd, right? Right. Um, so the FBI did try and do like flybys, and on their own reports, they're like, "This guy is a real douchebag." Right. He's not cooperative. Now, if anything, what that should do, somebody defected to the Soviet Union, FBI comes over to him and he acts like a real douchebag. That would raise my alarms. Um, But what many people think happened, and I kind of go along with this, is what the CIA did was use people adjacent to him. To try and get information from him without him realizing it. So he befriended when he came back to the United States. This again is just like this sort of weird political dynamics with Oswald. If I'm right, he came back because he legitimately became disen- disenchanted with the Soviet Union. Note for future reference, disenchanted with the Soviet Union, not disenchanted with Cuba. Right. Or, right? The, or the ideology. Or the ideology. It's just the way they were implementing it. Like, you know. You know what I always say about communism is like it's a beautiful concept. You right. just can't, you just can't make it work. Work and a hundred percent. And 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 you know, you know Oswald free, experienced a I lot want, of that firsthand. I want free healthcare. Right, you right, know? right. I, I want everybody to share in in you know in the uh, you know in, in the the glory that is you know um, prosperity. I mean, I want free food. I want everything to be everybody would work for every. Sounds wonderful. It doesn't work. Right, because there's no incentives. Good. Right. Right. And, you know, the, the the old line about the Soviet Union. Now, granted, it was towards the end of the, 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 the Soviet Union's existence, but you go into the grocery stores over there and you've got, you know, everyone's waiting online to get toilet paper and, and a couple of potatoes. Right. Because there's no incentive to actually work, work. to innovate, etc. Um, and, and interestingly, again, when Oswald writes his ideal theory out, he seems to try and account for that. Um, but that being said, the, the, he comes back, and to your point, he has – he befriends he, – he finds some people who befriend him, and of all things, the white Russian community. Those are the people who uh, hate the Soviet Union back to you know 1917 when the Rev- Russian Revolution happened, right? Um, they hate com- Soviet communism and or have to live in the United States and wish they could go back there one day in a free Soviet Union. One in particular, George de Morinchil, associates with him. And we know that George de Morinchil, he might not have been, and this gets overplayed, that he's not some CIA super spy at all, but he's certainly somebody who's on the periphery of that. And he actually is social friends with a guy by the name of Jay Walton Moore, who is unquestionably CIA and located in Dallas. And 
at least from the things that Demoran De Schultz says later on in his life before he commits suicide, and get that gets all people all kinds of crazy, right? Um, but more encouraged the relationship with Oswald. And my guess is is that they were tapping Demore and Schilt, probably with Demore and Schilt's knowledge, but even if it's not, find out what you can about what Oswald knows about how things are in the Soviet Union. Right. And see if you could look into, is his wife, like, legit, or is she working for the Soviets? Because remember, that's got to be a huge red flag <laughs> that she got out so quickly. And it turns out her uncle is a KGB, like, general or GRU general. Um, and just a quick aside, and... We have to move on, but uh, there was a defector in the 90s when Soviet Union fell. We just only found this out in the last two years, who said she was, I think it's called a sparrow. Right, She was right. sent over here without, uh, you know, to hook, she hooked up, was told to hook up with Oswald to get to the United States to spy over here. But she just decided, F you, I'm going to just be an American when she got here. Right. Any of it. Um, so it sets up a big picture issue, though, to the stuff that we're talking about, which is this, and to my theory, which is I don't believe Oswald was somebody who was actively working on behalf of American intelligence agencies. I do think he was, without question, very of keen interest to the United States intelligence agencies and was on their radar far more than they've ever been willing to admit as right. early as 1959 when he is defecting. Oswald returns back to the United States. Again, important for listeners to keep a few things in mind that are going to be themes that we're going to keep on coming back to in this James Bond killed John Kennedy scenario. Right. One, Oz, I do believe Oswald was somebody with his own political agenda and ideas, and they at least... Uh, leaned left, and it's particularly, as we'll see, in the Castro direction. The second is is that the American intelligence community would have been far more interested in Lee Harvey Oswald than we realize and that they've ever admitted to in terms of monitoring him especially. So those two items there, they're going to be real important for my for where I'm going as we go forward. So I'm going to jump a little bit, a few months after he returns, to an event that becomes very significant. People might know of something related to it because there's a very famous photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald with a rifle in his backyard. Yeah, he's like holding, holding it, right? Holding and a, the uh, shadows don't match? Right. Or, well, or you're not worried about it's, that? It's fake. I don't think it's fake. And the reason why is... First of all, his wife says she took it. Now, people will claim, oh, well, you know, she's either she's she's unreliable or she claimed that she took it f first from a different direction or whatever. But keep in mind that nowadays, at least, she insists that he was innocent. So why would she continue to lie about a, a and she says she took that photo. Right. Why would she continue to lie about that when it, as much as anything contributed to the perception that he was guilty because it is the rifle that was eventually found in the school book depository on the day of the assassination or is supposed to be right. Um, there's some strange things about the picture, by the way, he's holding two different newspapers, one socialist and one's communist and it gets into the weeds, but those folks don't generally like each other. It's, it's kind of like the quote unquote, MAGA and Rhino situation in the Republican Party. Um, so that's interesting. Isn't it interesting, too, that he would be holding a newspaper at all to, so that it kind of dates the – It like dates that's a very the event. Common thing. I think it was meant for a different purpose. I think Oswald was trying to – again, I will be in the minority on this. I think he was trying to establish himself – as a tough guy, so to speak, and right. a sort of militant for communism. Down with the cause. Yeah, he's, right. yeah. Now, you know, other people would say it was, the picture was fake to make him look that way. Um, 
I, again, for the reasons I said, I'm doubtful. It's also, you know, people make a huge deal of it, but even under the official version, it wasn't done in connection with the Kennedy assassination. It was conducted, it was done in connection with the assassination or attempted assassination of a different person, Edwin Walker, General Edwin Walker, who was a virulent right-wing general in the military, who proselytized to his soldiers with, you know, really hardcore anti-communist ideas and also racist, like, so he sort of in- combined them together. He, he would argue that the integration and the civil rights movement was a communist conspiracy type of situation. This kind of thing got him into real hot water with the Kennedy family, who eventually the Kennedy administration had him committed Right. And basically kicked out of the military. They did not like each other. Some people, somebody wrote a whole book arguing that Walker killed Kennedy. Right. I think it's a, 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 a my, very much a minority theory. But the the picture is in connection with what I believe, as with everything in this case, controversial, was Oswald attempting to kill or shoot at Edwin Walker, likely as part of of a conspiracy, by the way. In other words, he had help. Not necessarily some kind of grand CIA thing. He had help, possibly from some right-wing types who did not like Walker either. Uh, and there's evidence for this. I won't go into huge depth. Uh, that is going to be the trigger for Oswald A. getting out of Dallas. And the evidence he was involved is not only the picture. There's pictures of actual... Of, of the residence of, of Walker. Walker is, he's sitting at his, stu- in his study one night in April in 1962 and a shot gets fired through. Um, it might've been April 63. Uh, and it misses. Um, now mind you, he misses at point blank range on a stationary target. You might wonder how does this guy then graduate to right. two strikes on a moving target six months later, if he was the one that fired, yeah, and all sorts of controversy. So Walker survives uh, untouched, basically. But they don't catch the person who did it until, again, if you believe official version, afterwards when Oswald is arrested and eventually killed with the Kennedy assassination, they go through his materials and they find photographs of Walker's place. They find a letter to Marina, his wife, like basically saying, if I get caught, you have to get out of the country kind of thing. And it's clearly was from months before Marina says he was a part of it. Right. Um, right. And so you have this situation. Here's a key thing to understand. I was at a conference, really a sort of a show after the movie JFK came out where Oliver Stone was one of the speakers. I went with my father. I was 17 years old. Um, I think Gerald Posner was one of the speakers. And a guy named Edward Epstein was one of the speakers. Epstein was one of the early critics of the Warren Commission. He eventually becomes something of a defender of the official version. He said something at that get-together, which was incredibly interesting and nobody picked up on, which was he said – and he was – Edward Epstein in 1978 was one of the last people to interview that white Russian friend I talked about, George DeMorenschult, who had peripheral connections to the CIA. He said that not long before uh, DeMorenschult committed suicide in one of their interviews, DeMorenschult told him that – told Epstein that he had provided – because DeMorenschult believed that Oswald was a part of – the, the Walker assassination, DeMore and Schilt, you know, thought he might have actually put the idea in Oswald's head. He apparently had conveyed that to the, the guy from the CIA, J. Walton Moore. At least that's what Epstein said, that George DeMore and Schilt told me that he conveyed to J. Walton Moore that he thought Lee Harvey Oswald had something to do with the Walker assassination. Um, I believe that's what he said. He either said he did that or he said he provided him with a copy of the photograph from the backyard. Either way, 
understand that as of within a, you know several months of the Kennedy assassination, if that's true, they know that there's a guy in Dallas who tried to m- kill somebody with a rifle. They right. have that in their presumably somewhere in their files somewhere. Obviously, we don't have it. Um, that would be hugely important going forward. Um, so Oswald then flees, or I think he flees, goes to, moves to where he was born and raised, and it was in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I went to college. Uh, and he starts living there. And New Orleans is the next place where you really have to start explaining Oswald in the context of the assassination. And that's because Oswald, while he is simultaneously presenting himself and even setting up a fake front for a group called the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a American-based pro-Castro group, he is behind the scenes. The only people we know he's associating with appear to be anti-Castro. Right. The white, the white Russians. Is that? Well, no, no. Now he goes from associating with the white Russians as a former Soviet defector in Dallas. He goes to New Orleans and he starts hanging out with either actual anti-Castro exiles. Those are people who had to flee Cuba. Right. Right. And they settled in mostly Miami, but also in New Orleans or with Americans who help those people out. Okay. If you saw in the movie JFK, that's really the basis of Jim Garrison's investigation, which was the DA of New Orleans, who's featured as the hero of that movie in 1993. What they're saying is, or 1992, the strange thing about Oswald in New Orleans is here you have somebody who ostensibly is pro Castro. He's even handing out flyers urging people to join the pro Castro cause or the cause of easing tensions with Cuba. And yet if you study, and there is some controversy over it, but I think the evidence is pretty solid. If you study who he's associating with and interacting with behind the scenes, and I'm not talking like he's not, you know, going on picnics with them that we know of, but he's intermingling with anti-Castro exiles, the people who hate Fidel, people who actually are have CIA connections in many cases and are actively working on paramilitary operations in camps in Louisiana, training camps to get rid of the regime in Cuba. And it raises a really fundamental question, which is, what is Oswald up to? Right? Right. And also, what are the people who are interacting with him up to? Now, the people who think Oswald was a spy from the very beginning think that that's, that he's just building this legend up of being pro Castro on orders from people. But he's re- like, but his anti Castro associations, his right wing associations, that's who he really is. And again, I don't think that's the case with him. I think what you're dealing with in New Orleans is Oswald is trying, think about the James Bond element. Oswald is trying to infiltrate, whether it's on his own or potentially on the behalf of a group like the FBI, who's very worried about these anti-Castro people, some of whom are super radical, right? You know, we had a Cuban Missile Crisis. If these guys start sinking ships in, you know, the Gulf of Mexico or something, we could get into a war. So there's some evidence of that. Either way, big picture, I believe Oswald was in fact trying to infiltrate these groups and he was trying to do it by claiming to them and this we have evidence of that he's some sort of mercenary for hire who either can train anti-castro military people or participate in paramilitary activity 
That's how he's presenting himself. Do I think he fooled the people he was interacting with? To some extent. Um, And here's what I think happened as a key event. The people that Oswald's interacting with, some of them are, again, part of these groups that are really radical. They have been working in some cases with the CIA, but even the CIA can't control them. Uh, one of them is a group called the Directorio Revolutionary and Studiantil, the DRE. And they're like young, hot-headed students. And we can't get them under control, really. And the CIA, and we're going to talk about this, actually tries to shift up, going to be really important, who they assign to try and get them under control. And this is one of the groups that Oswald gets into, engages with. Another group of people Oswald engages with, he engages with these both American-based but also former, you know, native of Cuban people in, in a building. Everyone would recognize it if they saw JFK. It's called 544 Camp Street. Some controversy over it again. I do think he associated with those people. One in particular, a guy by the name of Ernesto Rodriguez who actually taught Spanish language and pretty good reason to believe that Oswald actually approached him and started at least training to learn Spanish from him. This guy is involved with some radical groups, but what's more important, this guy's brother and his father, and to some extent he, they're all CIA, and especially his brother Emilio, is hardcore CIA, anti-Castro, like somebody you send into Cuba to try and kill people kind of person. Right. Right? Or more relevantly, to work with the people who are going to kill people in Cuba. Like if there's ever an invasion again and we topple the regime and we have some kind of nasty business where we want to kill the, the communists who are hanging out, that's the kind of people he is so Emilio is. So if he if Oswald's associating with Ernesto, and Ernesto tells Emilio, that's big. But the other group, the DRE, Oswald actually gets into a fight with them on Canal Street in New Orleans. He's distributing literature. Yeah. And the these guys and stuff, right? Yeah, these guys, these Cubans come and they're like anti Castro Cubans. They come and they're like, oh, you gringo, how dare you? And they get into a scuffle, right? And part of the reason why they're upset is Oswald had actually gone to a store run by one of them and presented himself as being some kind of mercenary who could help out this guy's group. And the thing about that fight is there's a lot of suggestions that it was staged, Uh, The police officer who was arresting said it felt like it was staged. And the other key piece of evidence is Oswald seemed to have described it in a letter to the Fair Play for Cuba committee before it ever happened. Okay. So either he got into another fight that we don't know about or he somehow predicted it. So what am I getting at here? I think that that fight probably was staged. And what happened afterwards, even more importantly, was staged. Oswald then gets invited. He gets tried in court. By the way, all the exiles who show up in the court case, like like watching in the audience for this minor, relatively minor crime, they're all CIA connected. Okay. Um, Emilio may have even been one of them. I don't know if that's been firmly established yet, right? Um, Again, I mean, I don't know how many CIA people you – are interacting with on a daily basis. Uh, But Oswald seems to find a number of them. He then, um, so, so then he then gets invited to a radio debate and this famously is put on TV and is recorded and put out on a record that gets widely distributed by Ernesto after the assassination on it. More or less what happens is Oswald seems to, the radio host seems to have information on Oswald that 
the typical person probably wouldn't have readily available. It's possible you could get it if you do a deep dive, but people are suspicious that he had it. And he eventually confronts Oswald. Oswald says, um, you know, he's, this guy's trying to get Oswald to admit that the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is a communist organization because it's presenting itself in the United States as just, you know, some quasi leftists who feel that we're, you know, doing bad things in Cuba and it's not in our interest. So here's Oswald, who's doesn't, who's not even in the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He's basically created a fake front for it in New Orleans and is trying to write to them. He gets confronted on the fly with the fact that he had defected to the Soviet Union. And it seems to catch him off guard. And they're saying, and the radio host is basically using to say, how can you say your group isn't communist? You, bro, you're a Marxist who defected to the Soviet Union. Right. And Russia and Oswald tries to say something along the lines of, I'm, 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 I'm a Marxist Leninist, but I'm not a Marxist this. And the, the guy who's debating with him, Carlos Springer, is like, Marxist Leninist, Marxist, you know, Trotskyite, what the heck is the difference? There are obviously subtle differences, but it looks really bad for Oswald and it looks really bad for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. So I want you to think about something. The group that he got into a fight with and the group, the person that he debated, the DRE, they're one of these student radical groups that the CIA has a very difficult time getting control of. And they appointed a new CIA person to manage that group. His name is George Joannidis. He's going to be very important in a minute for what coincidentally he winds up doing later on. Joannidis is specific. We know what he was being told he needed to do. He needed to redirect the DRE away from military operations into propaganda operations. Right? Okay. So, Joe Anidi's group gets into a fight with Oswald that Oswald predicted that the police officer who arrested it insinuated looked staged, gets roped into a radio debate where he gets caught off guard with information that is hard to find and embarrasses the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, a pro-Castro group. In other words, it sure looks like the exact kind of operation that George Joannidis would have the DRA, would redirect the DRE into, a propaganda operation. Two things to understand about, and again, this gets speculative, few things to understand about Joannidis. We have all of his CIA files, except for the period when he ran the DRE and lived in New Orleans. Those are mysteriously missing. The CIA claims they never existed. The people in the DRE says we absolutely talked to, to Joe and Edis, and we absolutely at least told him about Oswald. Right. So there's we a record. No somebody, record of somebody may, any interaction you have with the FBI is documented. Right. Or the CIA. And they yeah, did yeah. that. And we have no files in it. Second thing to understand, we didn't even know who he was until the 1990s and the work of a reporter named uh, Jeff Morley and a, and that guy, John Newman, but really Jeff Morley. Um, third thing, one of the big reasons we don't know who he was is when the government, the co Congress reopened the Kennedy assassination 15 years later. They just happened to pluck somebody out of retirement who they said, this guy is, you know, he's, he has no connection to anyone in the Kennedy assassination. He's retired and you're going to use this guy to communicate with us. And he's going to communicate with you, Congress, back because he has clearance. And guess who that person was that they just happened to pluck out of retirement? I don't know. George Joannidis. Okay. When the people who ran Cong that congressional committee found that out 15 years later, they freaked the heck out because they knew they had been set up. 
they had a guy who was supposed to be some neutral arbiter between them and the CIA. He should have been a witness. Right. Why did the CIA do that? Why did they bring him back control to manage the, narr- the interactions? Uh, control the narrative. Uh, and then let me give you the other key thing for when we're going to be going forward. Joe Anides, he worked with the DRE, but he's part of a larger set of two groups within the CIA that's going to be very important for the next phase of our discussion. A group called the Special Affairs Staff in the CIA and a very closely related group called Jam Wave. Two things they have in common, they are both very actively working to try and get rid of Castro and get rid of the Castro regime, including assassination. So, again, you have to presuppose some, I think, common sense speculation. And again, some speculation that's building on speculation. Entertain my idea that this was a setup that the CIA, with Oswald's cooperation, arranged for a fake fight and Oswald then gets up and embarrasses this group he's a part of by failing in a debate with a DRE member. And you're going to say, why would Oswald do it? I'm about to tell you why Oswald would do it. As I said before, Oswald had been trying to infiltrate these groups and claiming that he is some sort of you know mercenary for hire who could help them get rid of Castro. The one group of people who would have known that there's something amiss is anyone in the CIA who was told that. So if the people in the DRE told Joe Anides and Joe Anides reported this out upstream, he would have been told this guy actually is a Soviet defector who's got some pro-Castro leanings. You better check into him. But he also provides an opportunity because if they buy into the idea that this one-time communist has come full circle and is really anti-Castro, anti-communist, and willing to work with them, they have the keys to the kingdom because the only people in 1963 who are getting in physical proximity to Castro in Cuba are American defectors to Cuba are Americans who are going over there and working on the sugar cane and stuff, buying into the... Castro will do radio programs with those people, but he is not seeing anybody else because he knows that people are trying to kill him. Right. Oswald is the perfect person. This is going to get into my theory eventually. If you want to get into Cuba and potentially get literally close to Castro, Oswald is the perfect kind of person to do it if you believe he has genuinely turned a corner and gone from enthusiastic communist to disinfected anti-communist. If he really wants to be a mercenary who's helping out the Cubans, how would you establish that? Is he willing to do a fake fight? Right. Is he willing to go into potentially go to jail? Is he willing to embarrass his own supposed group yeah, on a publicly. national TV show? Right. So what I believe Oswald essentially did was establish his bona fides on their request, essentially, with anti-Castro people and the CIA. And he is reported, by the way, after that debate, when he was embarrassed – the reports are that he went into a bar and was talking about he finally found his pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I hmm. think speculation, what he's saying is, I've been trying for my whole life to be this adventurer spy. I finally found people who can get me into that lifestyle. What I'm not sure if he knew right away, but I do believe with shortly after he gets recruited into, and this is where I'm going to go next, is 
remember, Joe and Edie's reports would have been going, which we can't gain access to. They wouldn't have just been going to people about the DRE. They're being fed up the chain to the special affairs staff and to JM Wave within the CIA, both groups within the CIA, both actively trying to literally kill Castro. And where I'm going next is I believe what happened is they are now going to try and use Oswald in some capacity in a Castro assassination plot. And they're desperate. And the reason why they're desperate is as August turns into September, they have found out through leaks, they being really the anti-Castro forces inside the CIA, the kinds of people who train people in the Bay of Pigs, uh, they have found out through leaks and wiretaps at the United Nations that John Kennedy is making secret overtures to Castro to try and normalize relations. And remember, from the mindset of somebody who was involved in the Bay of Pigs, you're not asking what I'm asking. Like, what I would ask is, is he really sincere or is he playing some game? If you're somebody who got betrayed at the Bay of Pigs, you think he's about to do the same thing all over again. Right. And you thought that you were on your way to possibly getting some kind of ground invasion in Cuba sometime in the next couple of years. And now you may not even get the end of Castro's regime. This guy is betraying you. He's an interesting thing to just keep in mind about the wiretaps at the United Nations. All the wiretapping is being done by a sub secret sub department of the CIA called Staff D. And for reasons I still don't understand, Staff D does one other thing. Staff D is the main go-to component in the CIA for assassinations overseas. So the same people who do wiretapping overseas and inside the United Nations, they also do assassinations overseas. They're actually run by a guy named William Harvey. William Harvey is the guy in charge of the ZR rifle program that was the CIA's foreign leader assassination program overseas. He's the guy. By the way, William Harvey despises the Kennedys, but especially Bobby. Everybody hates Bobby more, by the way. But right. um, keep that in mind. That's who's getting the information that John Kennedy is making secret backroom deals with Carlos Lechuga, the uh, ambassador to the United Nations for Cuba. He's sending out like secret through reporters overtures to try and normalize relations. I should say we don't know 100%. It's just widely suspected, given the operations we know that were operating, that, that, so, that they found out about it in advance. So if something happens, if something's going to happen, it either needs to happen immediately to Castro or immediately to Kennedy. Oh, yes, it's exactly what I'm getting at. And it also explains... So when I provide this theory to other people, they're going to say, especially when I get go a little bit further and discuss Oswald's trip to Mexico City very shortly, they're going to say, yeah, but they're doing all these things that seem incompetent, right? Like they have to, you know, they could get Oswald this, they could do Os help Oswald do that. And I'm saying, yeah, if they, if they're, they have time. They yeah, I was going to say to get next time. Right. To get next to Cuba, uh, get next to Castro, that would take a significant amount of time. You're not going over there cutting down some, helping cut down some fields of sugar cane, and you're having lunch with Castro. Right. And he's going to so, have to prove himself. Right. Uh, and if it ever happens at all. Right. They're desperate. And I think that explains why what happens over, and I'm going to talk about over the next two months seems pretty damn desperate um, now or or incompetent in many ways, right? So one of those things, the, the, first off, Oswald, who defected to the Soviet Union, 
uh, engaged in pro-Castro activities, which, by the way, this stuff is known to the FBI for sure, right, is writing to the Soviet embassy, is married to a Soviet wife, told your FBI agents to basically kiss his ass when you try to interview him, right? This guy goes to get a visa to go to Mexico and gets it in record time. Okay. Uh, the guy right behind him in line, we now know this, we found this out later on, happens to be a low-level CIA agent who was actually even aware of him in New Orleans. Um, was that because, so some people say, well, this particular, you know, consulate in New Orleans, they actually were part of a special pilot program that was getting people, you know, visas in record setting time. Okay. It's like Finland, right? right. How did Oswald happen to know to walk in there? At that time when they're on their pilot program, you know, that could be true. The other thing is there should be red flags in Oswald's file that make it nearly impossible for him to go to a foreign country without serious regulation or. It, or at it, least right. knowing that he had enough money to get himself back this time. Right. Well, you know? <laughs> there's interesting things on that front, but there. The, the thing to, to, to the other thing to keep in mind here is that right around this time, <laughs> which again, it's just it's like super coincidences, the FBI decides to lift the flash in his file. Like they actually have something in his file. Like this guy might be up to no good. They randomly decide to get rid of it. We still don't know why and why at that time. But it makes it possible for him to do these kinds of travels without raising the flags of the FBI. Right. Um, so right after that and before he goes to Mexico, Oswald goes and visits a woman in what is considered all the way back to the 60s. It's been called the proof of the plot. And it's more well known as the Odeo incident. And it is indeed incredibly hard to explain if you think Lee Harvey Oswald was acting alone. It's also, I believe, incredibly misunderstood. So Oswald then goes and visits. The, he goes, he shows up at the door of this woman. Her name is Sylvia Odio. She is a Cuban exile. She's living with her sisters in Dallas. She's recently moved there, I believe, from Miami. Her father, this is going to be key, her father is located in a Cuban prison at this time. We'll tell you why in, 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 a, in a bit. It all circles back. Oswald shows up at the door with two people. One is named, they, they go by their Cuban war names. One is named Angel. One is named Leopoldo. That's not their real names. It's like their code names. Right. They... They tell Sylvia Odio that they're part of a group of exiles known as Jure. I forgot what that's in Spanish. There are many, just so people know, DRE, Jure, there are many different subgroups of people, uh, anti casho exiles, people who were forced off the island, had their properties confiscated, participated mm -hmm. in the Bay of Pigs, who've been working very actively to try and get rid of the Castro regime. It's like fingers of a hand. However, many of them don't get along with each other. And one thing to keep in mind, especially for how you might appeal to Lee Harvey Oswald, is Jure is a, it was sometimes called Castroism without Castro. They are a left wing anti Castro group. If Castro's regime were to be deposed, and there was some sort of joint government, at least as of 1963, Jure would be part of a coalition government. The right-wing groups that hated Castro, like Alpha 66, hated Jure. Hated, hated, hated Jure. 
Uh, I am going to contend to you that the two people who showed up at Sylvia Odio's house and said they were Jure were not Jure. They were right wing, not left wing. That's okay. going to be important in when I get to the final reasons for the plot. They show up at Sylvia Odio's house, her apartment, out of the blue. She does not know them. She's immediately suspicious of them because they know her father's war name and code name. And they start floating it to her. And they're basically approaching her at that meeting to see if they can use her for help, you know, in getting equipment and fundraising for a, you know, groups that are trying to get rid of Castro. She's suspicious of them. She's new to the area. She kind of sends them on their way. And the American who's with them, who at the very least looks exactly like Lee Harvey Oswald, I'll explain a little bit later. They do say to her, by the way, they, they tell her he's an American. He's with us. He was once in the Navy and he's coming from or once in the military and he's coming from New Orleans, all of which are true of Lee Harvey Oswald. Right. Um, he doesn't speak really when he's there. Then one of them calls her back. I want everybody to remember this is late September 1963. John Kennedy's still alive. We're two months away from Dallas. Here's what he says to her. He starts talking to her. And by the way, she's a very attractive woman. If you ever see pictures of her, apparently every she even got a priest to basically have an affair with her and break his vow. So there's that. But she's he's talking to her and he's saying to her, you know, he's, he brings up the the original mission and then he starts dovetailing or diverting or into digressing into the American. And she says his name is Leon. Right. Okay. And Leon, he tells her he's, he's hardcore. He's pretty crazy. He says we should have killed Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. No, this is happening two months before the, Kennedy assassination. Right. That's why people call this the proof of the plot. Here you have somebody who's talking about connecting someone who looks exactly like Lee Harvey Oswald, probably was Lee Harvey Oswald, to the idea of killing Kennedy two months before Kennedy is killed. What people leave out is the next thing he says. He paraphrasing. He also says, we're a bunch of sissies. He says, if you got him, Oswald, Le Leon, into to Cuba, if you could get him into the Cuban underground, he's the kind of person who could kill Castro. Okay. This is all being said two months before he's the assassination, but notably one week before Oswald's, or a few days before Oswald's in Mexico City, which I'll get to in a bit. I want to go back to Sylvia Odio's father, who she writes because she's so bothered by this meeting. She writes him in a Cuban prison. He, by the way, writes her back and is like, do not have anything to do with these people. There should be very few people in the United States who should know my war name. But you know what you wouldn't, if you knew his war name, and you knew him closely enough in Cuba or somebody told you, you would have known two other facts about Sylvia Odio's father. One, the reason why he was in prison was because he participated, and I'm going to say participated loosely, in a plot to assassinate Fidel Castro in 1960. And I say loosely because he wasn't directly involved in the plot. He had hid somebody in the Cuban underground at his property, and that is where that person was found. Okay. So All right. So that's the guy who is in – so again, if you're desperate to get Oswald into Cuba and desperate to connect him with people who might be willing to get him into a place where he could possibly kill Castro or participate in a plot, he doesn't have to be a shooter. Her father is a pretty good guy to try and take a swing at. There's another interesting thing that we only just found out about Sylvia Odia. Like, we're talking in the last two months. Apparently, she was a romantic interest 
of Carlos Lechuga, who I just mentioned five minutes ago. Yeah. He's the person who Kennedy is trying to use to normalize relations with Cuba. Right. Isn't uh, that a coincidence? It's going to get worse than that in about five minutes. Um, so then Oswald's on his way to Mexico. And I'm not done with Silvia Odio's father yet because that plot is going to be very significant. Oswald goes to Mexico City. Mexico City is like a hub for espionage around the world at this time. Because on the one hand, it's under the sphere of influence of the United States. It's police force, it's government, all of them are on the take with the United States. On the other hand, they have a long, ugly relationship with the United States in terms of history that makes communism appealing in that part of the world. So they're like a center for espionage for both the Americans and the Soviets, but also the Cubans who were not, you know, too far off on a boat trip. Oswald does some strange things in Mexico City. So first off, on the surface, it looks like he's trying to get a visa to go back to the Soviet Union. But the one thing that's clear is he did not like his time in the Soviet Union. To get to the Soviet Union, he's going to try and get a visa to stop in Cuba first. And I have to take a second here to tell everybody that if you dug into Mexico City and I keep on saying he, there's a whole set of theories that he was being impersonated the entire time he was in Mexico City with a double. Long involved story. I don't believe that to be the case in person. I do believe he was impersonated by phone. So he goes to the Cuban consulate and he gets frustrated because he doesn't have the requisite materials he needs to go to Cuba, but he's trying to tell them, bro, I'm a, I'm in the fair play for Cuba committee. I went, I defected to the Soviet Union. I'm diehard communist, right? Why aren't you going to give me a visa? So he gets into fights with people there. They tell him, look, you want to make this work. You want to get a layover in Cuba on the way to the Soviets. You got to, first of all, you got to get me like, you got to have a passport. You don't even have a passport with a photo on it. You got to get me some kind of permission or approval from the Soviet embassy. So the Cuban consulate sends him to the Soviet embassy, goes to the Soviet embassy. They're not very cooperative. He goes back and forth over a span of three or four days. And according to the Soviets, and these are KGB people and there's some issues, he eventually just freaks the fuck out. Excuse my language. Did I appropriate use of the language? Sorry there. Uh, And breaks down in the Soviet embassy because he's not getting his way. Okay, so he winds up failing at this, but several strange things happen as he's doing this. Let me give you a few. First off, the folks in Mexico, the CIA is surveilling both the Cuban consulate and the Soviet embassy. And even though Lee Harvey Oswald is supposed to have gone in and out of both buildings on multiple occasions, their story to the present day is, oops, due to a series of unfortunate events, we have no record of him actually going to either building except reports. No okay. tapes, no photographs. He At one point they said, yeah, you know, uh, our, our systems just happened to be broken those two days. And anybody we'd have who would be taking uh, pictures, they must have been on siesta time. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we have no surveillance of him. By the way, who would be handling surveillance of him in Mexico City? 
uh, Staff D. Okay. Same people who would be intercepting the communications at the United Nations, the same people who handle assassinations. Okay, can I ask a question real quick? Yes, absolutely. Was, I'm sorry. Do you, think, do you think he was really trying to go to the Soviet Union, or you think he was just trying to use that as a, a, a way to stop at Cuba and get I, off? I think 100% he was using it as a way, as a pretext to get into Cuba. And okay. I think he was encouraged, but I'm going to say this in a bit. I think. He was trying to play the people who were thinking they were playing him, and I'll get that in a second. The second very strange thing that happens, Oswald, again, he sets off alarms. So the CIA outpost, we call it the Mexico City Station, they send, in, they send a request up to the headquarters in Langley, Virginia by cable, the early version of email fax, basically. What can you tell us about this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald? He came into the Cuban consulate, threw a fit, going back and forth with the Soviet embassy. Can you tell us anything about him? And so the CIA writes them back, says the headquarters. And they say, we regret to inform you that the latest information we have on Lee Harvey Oswald is May of 1962. Like, he's basically on his way back to the United States. That's the last thing we have. Sorry, he's not very interesting. Bye. It's like a paragraph. Right. Here's the problem. That's completely false. So CIA headquarters had been receiving all of the FBI reports and CIA reports, but a lot of really in-depth FBI reports on Lee Harvey's Oswald's activities since he came back to the United States. So the guy who the most suspicious thing you said about him was he returned to the United States in May with a Soviet wife. Well, he has, they knew at Langley that he had maintained contact with the Soviet embassy, that he had engaged in ongoing uh, pro-Castro activity, Right. That he was a member of the Fair Play for Cuba committee, or purported to be, and that he had engaged in a street fight distributing pro Castro literature. Right. All of these things would raise huge alarms at Mexico City Station. And they did not tell them any of that. And John Newman, who I mentioned, and Jeff Morley, who I mentioned, they analyzed the routing slips for these FBI reports. So they were the ones who not only knew that the F, that the CIA had all of this material, it was supposed to be an Oswald's 201 file. If it was, they lied about having it there. And if it wasn't, why was it mysteriously removed right when he was going to Mexico City, Right. And they looked at the people, the the Morley and Newman, they went looking for the people who signed off, authenticated this document. Right. And not only that, they had had signed off as reading all of those FBI materials personally. So why did you tell? They found one. And they went to her and they said, and this is in the mid-1990s, 30 years later, why did you tell your own people that you had no up-to-date information on Lee Harvey Oswald when you had all of these really relevant points and facts that you read. They eventually get her to admit that she was signing off on something she knew to be untrue. Again, remember, this is for events two months before the assassination involving the person who is eventually going to be accused of killing the president. I'm signing off on something that I know to be untrue. It's indicative, I kid you not, she says, it's indicative of a keen interest by the CIA and Oswald two months before the assassination. Then she says, I can only speculate from looking at the routing and where it's going, but... 
it's telling me that the people in the remember that's name from before i'll remind everybody yeah the people in the special affairs staff had kept lee harvey oswald's information from mexico city station on a need to know because it was on a need to know basis quick reminder to your listeners the special affairs staff was the group within the cia that was trying to kill fidel castro the special affairs staff is the group within the cia that employed that guy george joanitis who would have been involved with that staged fight with oswald a month before in new orleans and now according to somebody in the cia they are lying to their own people about what they know about lee harvey oswald two months before the assassination when he's trying to get into cuba but she doesn't say who told her what to say she just says no she doesn't specify like jimmy and you know whatever department told me it gets inferred by the people who are above her in the chain of command on the routing sheets okay and they are indeed from the special affairs staff okay um now the other element to this that's strange about mexico city is that somebody calls the cuban consulate says they are lee harvey oswald and starts asking questions that lee harvey oswald would never ask makes no sense Okay. And that clearly looks like an impersonation. And my sense is the people at the Mexico City station are trying to figure out what he's up to. The people in headquarters, they're trying to lower, as one researcher said, they're trying to dim the lights on Lee Harvey Oswald. The reason they're trying to do that is they're trying to get Lee Harvey Oswald out of desperately trying to get him out of Mexico into Cuba at the last minute to see if he could somehow participate in an assassination plot against Castro. I don't believe Lee Harvey Oswald would have gone through with any assassination plot against Castro. I believe if Lee Harvey Oswald got to Cuba, he would have tried to find the nearest senior member of the Cuban Communist Party, ratted out that he was part of a anti-Castro assassination plot in hopes of becoming a hero to the Cuban revolution. I think that's was his agenda. It got sabotaged also. Uh, so this is getting me to my key factor and I'm gonna take us to Dallas in a minute. I want us to take us to a different situation. What were, some of the plots that were in operation to plan to kill Castro that were going on in the 60s. A lot of people know the crazy plots, like yeah, exploding I, I, cigar, yeah. um, po- you know, poison his uh, or infect his scuba suit with tuberculosis. Right. By the way, he got the CIA got some of their ideas from Ian Fleming, the author of the James Bond novels. Yeah. He had come to visit John Kennedy and John Kennedy asked him, what do you do about Cuba? And I think his first response was something witty, like ignore it. And then he started listing off all of these, you know, crazy science, you know, not science fiction, but spy fiction type of plots. In the presence of them was Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA. Right. And Alan Dulles then strikes up a relationship with Ian Fleming and like hits him up for these kinds of ideas. Ian Fleming, or not Ian Fleming, but the guys that made one of the Bond movies, the set guys, um, got a phone call after one of the James Bond movies had come out about the rebreather. (laughs) Yeah. You know that it was just a little thing. It, it had yes. two little tubes, and it was a rebreather rebreather that he could swim underwater. And they got a phone call from someone at like 
you know, CIA or somewhere, some military Technical services. Yeah. Saying, listen, that device, like how, you know, how long they go, is that a real device? And they were like, they were like, yeah, it's a, it's a real device. Like they didn't really understand what they were saying. And they said, well, how long can you breathe underwater with it? And he goes, as long as you can hold your breath. And they were like, oh, so he, you know, he doesn't work. I mean, it's a, it's a prop. Like, what, what are you? And they were like, oh, okay. We thought, oh, never mind. Not surprising given what I know about CIA. Yeah. Um, now those are the goofy plots. There was another plot and it's going to be very significant in the long run. Um, it's called Operation Pathfinder. And the plot of Operation Pathfinder was to assassinate Fidel Castro while he was riding in his Jeep using a long range rifle from a high floor building in a moving vehicle, the Jeep. All Sounds right. Familiar. The person who concocted that plot was a man by the name of Carl Jenkins. Carl Jenkins, who, by the way, is still alive at like 99 years old. Um, many, many years later, well, first of all, just what we know without this story. He was one of the big time paramilitary trainers of the people at like the Bay of Pigs. So he was like, you know, almost Green Beret type. Years later, decades later, he gets actively involved and becomes part of a, as a peripheral figure in Iran Contra. Part of the reason why we know what he did in Iran Contra was, uh, materials and testimony given by somebody who had become his very good friend when they worked together privately in the Middle East. His name is Gene Wheaton. Gene Wheaton approached the Assassinations Records and Review Board, the group that was formed after the movie JFK, to release files on the Kennedy assassination. If you ever have time, I can give you a very unique story. My students, high school students, are the only high school class in American history to have written a bill that became a federal law. And they based it on the JFK Records Act. It's about civil rights cold cases. That being said, um, we got years later after the, the review board disbanded, we got records of their outside investigations. One of them was they were approached anonymously by this guy, Gene Wheaton, who had been a private contractor who had peripheral connections to intelligence figures from his time in the Middle East, who had become very good friends with this guy, Carl Jenkins, this paramilitary trainer for the CIA, um, when they were both working privately in the Middle East on some sketchy things, and became such good friends that, that Gene Wheaton basically stayed at his place with Jenkins and his wife for weeks on end. Jenkins, Wheaton approaches the review board and says, look, I have some information to provide to you. Um, under no circumstances are you to ever put out anything that releases my name. Of course, they made a mistake and we found it in the 2000s. So that didn't work. He says, look, I stayed with a one-time CIA guy and apparently somebody who has some contract kind of interactions during Iran-Contra. His name was Carl Jenkins. And Carl, he was heavily involved in anti-Castro operations, covert operations in the 1960s before he went to do similar stuff in Vietnam. And Carl and I were very good friends. And Carl would invite over a lot of the old school, you know, in that time they wouldn't, they'd be in their 40s. Um, a lot of 40s and 50s, a lot of the old school anti-Castro people he trained and developed because they became like family to him. He would invite them over to drink and have, you know, a good time. And I got to be friendly with them because I was friendly with him. But Carl wasn't very good. And these people, some of them were not very good at holding their liquor. And at one of the get-togethers, Carl started talking about John Kennedy, who he and the other people there did not like because of Bay of Pigs. And they basically said that they, like the people in the room, 
were training people to kill John Kennedy, not kill John, sorry, kill Fidel Castro. Remember what I told you, Operation right. Pathfinder. And they implied pretty clearly that they turned it. When things broke down, they turned it on JFK. Okay. Um, Carl Jenkins <laughs> had been involved in an earlier assassination plot against probably more than one against Fidel Castro. Um, in 1960, uh, well, I should say, I should be careful. Um, Carl Jenkins had been called out of retirement in the late 1970s, right around the time the Kennedy assassination was reinvestigated, randomly out of the blue to debrief somebody who had just been released from a Cuban prison. The person who he had been called to debrief had been somebody who, and you got to ask yourself, why would they call him to debrief somebody? It implies certainly out of retirement that he had to have intimate knowledge of who this guy was and what this guy was doing. Why else would you bring somebody out of retirement? You could have anybody and your, their mother do it, right? Right. Right. Including active employees. Carl Jenkins is brought in to debrief this person. So it turns out that the person he's brought back to debrief is somebody who was involved in a CIA plot against Castro in 1960 uh, that failed, obviously, try and blow him up with a bazooka. Okay. Uh, it got shut down and the person had to escape. Uh, the person was eventually found on somebody's farm. The farm was Amador Odio. Okay. The father of Sylvia Odio. Yeah, this is the guy he was hiding? Yes. That's why Amador Odio was in prison in 63 when Odio, when Sylvia, his daughter, wrote him about this strange visit. Now, you ask yourself, who would know Amador Odio was in the underground and who would know that Amador Odio in 1963 was involved, you know, could be somebody could be involved in a, an assassination plot? Right. My guess is would be any CIA officer who was involved in that 1960 plot. Guess, speculation, but I don't think it's too hard. My guess is Carl Jenkins was the person who arranged that plot. That's why he was called to called out of retirement to debrief the person who escaped from the prison. And why that debrief never mentions anything to do with the assassination plot, even though that's the reason why the guy was in prison. He was right. steered away from talking about it by Carl Jenkins. Okay. So let me return to the Cuban. Now. Oswald comes back to United States. United States sets up in back in Dallas. Um, he's estranged from his wife, uh, and part of the time he's living away. And there is some suggestion. I think it's pretty solid that he is visiting a home in Dallas that belongs, it's privately owned, but it's being used as a sort of hangout for radical Cuban exiles. It's the, called the House on Harlandale Street in Kennedy assassination lore. Uh, he's reported to the police as having visited that home, Oswald is. He's the radical groups that are associated with that and it gets very controversial are connected to a cia officer in part by the name of david phillips i'll we'll come back to him in a bit now just so that you know after the assassination these guys who these exiles who are hanging out in the harlandale we're talking like november 23rd they all book out of town. They all get out of Dallas. We're at a, at a place with exiles where Oswald is seen as attending. All right. Um, Oswald, of course, back to our original. He's He has the rifle from back when he was tried to assassinate General Edward Walker. Right. 
If you believe Edward Epstein, the CIA at least has partial, if not full, knowledge that Oswald was involved with that assassination. The CIA knows that he had been part of a uh, anti-Castro propaganda campaign in New Orleans. They know that he had been part of a, a if, if you follow my line of thinking, that they had used him, and I say CIA, I mean mid-level people, people like Carl Jenkins. They knew that he had been part of a CIA operation to assassinate, get into Cuba and try and assassinate him that failed. Remember what the, the guy said at Odio's house. Initially, Oswald tries to kill Castro, but the very first thing he really? has him say is he's the kind of guy who could who thinks we should have killed Kennedy, right, after the Bay of Pigs. Right. So flash forward to November 22nd. What do I think happened? I do think there was more than one shooter in Daly Plaza. I believe it was very likely some combination of either exile, organized crime, CIA type of people, all of whom were involved in anti-Castro assassination plots. By the way, Ruby was involved in gun running to anti-Castro forces. So he's mafia connected and he's exile connected. I don't know if Oswald fired shots. And I don't know if he fully understood what was happening. Uh, you know, his initial behavior after the assassination we're talking like immediate 10, 15 minutes after, does not strike me as somebody. First of all, it may provide him with an alibi. There's very limited time for him to get to the, the, the lunchroom he's found in with a Coke. That police officer pulled a gun on him, and Oswald, according to the police officer, act like it was nothing. This is a guy who couldn't sleep at night after he attempted to kill General Edwin Walker. We're supposed to believe, you know, a minute ago, he shot the president of the United States. He's got a Coke in his hand, and he's calm, cool, and collected. Right. Um, he leaves the building. Again, he, that's a little bit suspicious. Yeah, but, but you think maybe maybe he realized at that point he was a patsy? Like he's, I like, think, he's starting to put it together? I think within 15 to 20 minutes, he realizes it. Why? Well, one of the things that makes him look like he didn't know what was happening is he offers his, according to one witness, a couple of witnesses, he offers his cab to another woman. I guess it's Southern, you know, manners, but if you just are yeah, killed- if you're in a hurry. States, right? He gets on a bus, and on the bus is when it becomes clear that John Kennedy has been shot and killed. My theory, and I'm not alone, and I'm not the first to come up with it by any means, is that, what, that Oswald may have been roped into a plot to- scare Kennedy, or at least he was told, we're going to fire some shots, some blanks at John Kennedy, or we're going to fire some shots over his head. You bring this rifle, um, and he'll learn his lesson about Cuba. Probably from people, and we have some evidence of this from a guy named John Martino, probably from people who, who were trying to reach Oswald as leftists. Uh, Oswald gets out of the building, hears that the president has actually been shot, and at that point he starts to realize, "Oh shit!" Yeah, I'm right? in the wrong, wrong place, or he, yeah, wrong place, the wrong time, or the right place at the right time, depending on whose point of view you're looking at. When he gets dropped off by a cab near his rooming house, um. The, the cab drops him off like a couple of blocks down. Now, I could go into a whole long-winded thing how it might be an attempt for him to reach somebody who's anti-Castro right across the street from there. But most people think, and it could be both, that he was looking to see if anybody had, any police had come to his house. Right. It he was walks other... back to his rooming house, and then he decides to get a gun. Again, if you're starting the day thinking you're going to kill the president, why wouldn't you have gotten the gun and brought it with you to the depository for the, right. you know to, to shoot your way home, right? He changes clothes, all right? He then goes on the street. Now, a lot of controversy as to whether or not, lots of, it could go into a long story, I won't. He's 
I believe, confronted by a police officer named J.D. Tippett. He may have been driven, though, to that area because it would have been awfully fast for him to get there. J.D. Tippett gets shot probably at least by Oswald, if not Oswald and somebody else. But, you know, everybody makes it out to be, oh, he must have also killed Kennedy. That's what the Warren Commission said. That's your Rosetta Stone. We can prove that he shot Tippett. Therefore, he must have shot Kennedy because why else would he shoot Tippett? Well, at this well, point, he, at if he, this point, right, right he's ahead. trying to escape. Yeah, he's trying to escape. He's like, I've been set up. Nobody's going to believe me. I need to get out of here. And I'm going to kill anybody that comes in, is crosses my path that's going to stop me. He gets rid of his jacket on his way to the Texas theater, walks into the Texas theater without buying a ticket. Now, the interesting thing about the theater is it's actually a pretty good place, Spycraft, to meet somebody who you need to meet. And there are reports that Oswald appeared to be kept on moving around, trying to sit next to people. Like... Move We're together. Next, right? Hoping, my guess, to find somebody. Now, I, I mentioned a guy named John Martino, who, by the way, knew Sylvia Odio. John Martino was a mob-connected, anti-Castro-connected, CIA-connected character who had been in prison in Cuba. He may have been in prison with Odio's father, right, before being sent back to the United States and basically going on a book tour um, with a book called I Was Castro's Prisoner. Uh he tries to plant stories at, right, immediately after the assassination linking Oswald to Castro. But years later, after he dies, his very close friend, his or business partner, a reporter with whom he is very close to, his wife and his son, who was, would have been young in 1963 but old enough to remember things, all came forward and said, John told us stuff about the Kennedy assassination. Okay. And specifically what he told us was that it was basically an anti-Castro situation. Anti-Castro people had convinced Oswald that they were leftist and had set him up in the Kennedy assassination some way, somehow. We don't have a huge lot of details. Um, Oswald got, he was supposed to have been killed. Maybe it was the police officer. Who knows? He was supposed to have been killed. Not, he was supposed to be taken out of the country. I'm sorry. Supposed to be taken out of the country and killed. No questions asked. And it was supposed to fall on the doorsteps of Fidel Castro. But things broke down. He goes to the theater because that's where he was told to meet in the event of an emergency. But the person doesn't show up. The cops descend and arrest him. And we have to get Ruby to kill him. Because he may know too much if he gets to trial. Martino's son remembers on the day of the assassination that his father got phone calls after the assassination from people in Miami and that his father turn pale as a ghost and then his wife and the reporter said that he had actually once told them that one of the shooters had been in their house at one point visiting okay um he has all the right connections and if you go to my co-writer on the king assassination books larry hancock's book someone would have talked it's really about just trying to trace all of the John Martino evidence and line it up with all the other evidence we know. Flash forward the 80s. This gentleman, David Phillips, who has been accused of involvement in the Kennedy assassination, accused of, by this point in time, having interactions with Lee Harvey Oswald, um, and was very actively involved in, in, in anti-Castro anti-Cuban regime groups was involved in Jam Wave, the anti-Castro operation. He's written some regular books, nonfiction books, but he's also written some non some fiction, I put it in quotes books. Um, one of them I think is called the Carlos Contract. He never published it. He died before anyone got access to it. 
okay. in the book at the end. In the character in the book, here's what David Phillips says. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. I was, as the character, remember, so fiction. I was Lee Harvey Oswald's case officer. We had him in a plan to kill Fidel Castro. On November 22nd, I was caught with my pants down when the same plan was used, but on John Kennedy. I still carry that guilt. Was right. that fiction or does that make, as I believe, everything make sense? To put the long story short to everybody, uh, both John Kennedy's quasi-obsession behind the scenes with trying to get Castro, which included backroom deals that may have been serious and may have not have, but definitely included some with his knowledge, some probably without his knowledge or blessing, interactions with really bad people who hated his gods. And Lee Harvey Oswald's obsession with trying to be part of the spy world, something that he was on the outside looking in on until he hits New Orleans and proves his worth, they both align on November 22nd when a covert operation meant to kill Castro was turned on John Kennedy and it ultimately fails to accomplish its goal, which was to frame Castro for John Kennedy's assassination, causing American people to go into an uproar and invade Cuba. And it fails because people in the higher end of from President Johnson to Earl Warren realize that Oswald seems to lead to Castro's door. And if we invade Cuba, we will get World War III, and so they have to cover everything up. That plus the people who actually may have known that their operation was turned on John Kennedy or they had contacts with Lee Harvey Oswald, however innocent, they all covered it up too. And so that's sort of my, my end story there. There was a lot there. Um, throwing it back to you. Um. I so what about so um Jack Ruby shooting Oswald why does that happen like how, how do you like if had Oswald lived you know I mean obviously there's good reason for him to be killed but how did they how does how do you how do you get Ruby to kill Oswald okay so I think the key thing here is I think Ruby had some vague sense of stuff. Something big was going to go down. Um, the, he was doing some suspicious stuff in the months and the weeks leading up to the assassination. I doubt you would never want Jack Ruby to know in advance that John Kennedy was going to be killed. Part of that is because Ruby, I don't know if he had some kind of personality disorder or what have you, but the one big thing about him, two big things, he's impulsive and he's violent, which leads some to think that it was, you know, off the cuff. But he's one of the big time wannabes mm -hmm. in the organized crime world. Like he really wants to be a bigger player in the right. nightclub scene, in, in the, the quasi-organized crime scene. And for that reason, because he's a little bit off, because you're gonna have to to get somebody to shoot somebody in a basement, you're gonna Surrounded need Surrounded by things, police. Right. You're going to have to, they're going to have to be a little bit off. You're going to have to hope that they know the police and Jack Ruby knew them quite well. They used to go to his club. Yeah. Um, and you're going to have to get somebody who, you know, even if the person says something, you might not believe him because he's so weird. Right. I was going to say, to be honest, like you could maybe make the attempt to have Ruby do it. 
But even if he doesn't, I mean, Oswald, you know, worst case scenario is Oswald is not someone that is going to be extremely credible if he is, um, you know, questioned or goes to trial. And it's not like it's the only opportunity you have. There's going to be other opportunities to get to him. And, and, you know, part of the issue is this. Oswald doesn't say everything. He could say a lot of stuff that he knows right there to the police and doesn't say it. And I think part of that is, is in his own head. And by the way, whenever I see his face in the interviews, I think, I, I, you know, it's, it's a huge, obviously speculative body language reading. I always see him as, as his face is saying, his body language is saying, you have got to be freaking kidding me with these people. And these right. people are the people who set him up. Like, they start asking him questions like, oh, my gosh, they know that too, right? He's got to be worried about the assassination attempt on Walker and that no one's going to buy the fact that he at least conspired in an attempt on Kennedy, right? And who's going to believe a communist, like you said, when he says, oh, I really didn't fire the shots. It had to be somebody else. I don't really know who they are. Yes, they that is my gun. My rifle, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 not going to go over too well. So he's got to be calculating too. But to these folks, I think they have to think that if it hits the fan and he's facing the death penalty, that maybe he's going to say more of what he knows. Yeah, but what does um, he know? He doesn't well, know. Well, I think what he would he, be he able was... to know is that he'd be able to tell you who the people who told him to be near a phone in the depository were on November 22nd, 1963, right? Because somebody has to be able to make sure that he's not outside with 50 people watching him. Right. Of course, I say this, and there's a major ongoing theory based on a grainy photograph that he was outside. Um, I think that has to be looked into, but my general probable sense is that was just somebody who's as short as I am going up to the steps of the depository trying to get a view of the president Uh, because I know whenever I'm in a parade I'm short I have to find high ground if I'm going to see over anybody so this picture of what looks to be Lee Harvey Oswald in front of the depository when I say looks to be I'm talking very grainy right so Um, may just be a random person like me so who did kill him though ultimately I believe it was the kinds of people that Carl Jenkins was training. So Carl Jenkins, according to Gene Wheaton, has mafia connections. Carl Wheaton's, Wheaton, definitely, they're practically his sons, has anti-Castro exiles. And Carl Wheaton, and sorry, not Carl, Carl Wheaton, I'm sorry, Carl Jenkins. Carl Jenkins has connections to people in the special affairs staff. And I suspect if it goes up high, maybe to somebody like... Uh, William Harvey, the people in the assassination programs within the sort of rogue element of the CIA assassination programs that includes people who are mob and organized crime connected and includes people who are exiles. And the exiles are really the front lines of everything. Okay, so he gets shot. It gets blamed on um, on uh, Oswald. Um, we didn't invade Cuba. Well, so here's what we know. Didn't, didn't work, right? Correct. So there's a very famous scholar by the name of Peter Dale Scott, and he calls it the two phase of the conspiracy, uh, unconnected in many, in some ways to each other. The first is the, the actual plot to kill Kennedy, and he's not that far off of where I am. Um, just I think he thinks it goes higher. But then the second is the plot to, to try and make it look like one person did it. And he says the first plot, um, the second plot and conspiracy emerges out of the first. And that's when people like Jagger Hoover and Lyndon Johnson start putting two and two together in their heads about Oswald's visits to the embassies and consulates in Cuba. They they get a, a later report that Oswald supposedly threatened Kennedy's life when he was in the consulate. So... They're they're very concerned because they know how close we are to World War III. Lyndon Johnson is on record calling people, including Earl Warren, 
and saying to him, including Richard Russell, his friend who was on the Warren Commission, um, neither man wanted to be on the on the commission. Right. But how does how does uh, Lyndon Johnson get them on? He says, "Well, if you want a hundred, you know, a hundred million dead Americans on your head when this becomes World War III." We so know he said right. that to Richard Russell and and Earl Warren's son uh, said he said it to Earl Warren. So he's very early on. He's saying stuff to J. Edgar Hoover. Um, there's, you know, the reason I don't think we have photographs of Oswald in Mexico City is some of them may be too provocative as to who else is in the picture. I think Lyndon Johnson and the people immediately around him put what they thought was two and two together really fast. Um, Lyndon Johnson years later would tell a reporter, I'll tell you something. John Kennedy was running a murder incorporated in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or not, I think Lyndon Johnson believed it. And he said, Kennedy got Castro. Kennedy, C Castro got Kennedy. Tr Kennedy tried to get Castro. Castro got Kennedy first. I don't think he was, accurate on that but i th think he had good reasons to have that as his first and major suspicion well i mean i can see saying to the warren you know uh or you know what was warren's first name earl warren earl warren i can see saying like you know investigate it but once you're done you know you you know, you need to really think hard, long and hard whether or not you want this to point to Castro. You know what I mean? So like, absolutely. I, like kind of like, uh, did you, I mean, obviously I'm sure you saw, you know, you saw the, uh, um, the Bay of Pigs movie. What was it? 13 day. What was it? 13 days was the Cuban missile crisis movie. Cur Cur I'm sorry. Yeah. Cur uh, Cuban missile crisis when they, you know, when, uh, he calls, the, um, they, his chief of staff, calls uh the pilot and says look oh, yeah, you, yeah. you were not fired on do not get yourself fired and he says on. it's a it's a bird uh yeah bird, bird shot hit. or whatever yeah. yeah no bird yeah that uh we hit a bunch of birds you birds know, yes and like birds it's he's exactly, like yeah, I birds. Think it's exactly that it was a cover story and remember there's different layers to the cover story right so one of the other warren commission members is alan dulles alan dulles was the one of the originators of the castro assassination plots he does not want for that. That is a top secret thing all the way up into the late 60s, early 70s. He doesn't want that coming out either. He sure as heck does not want it known that we were willing to use the mafia to help pull it off. Right. So he shuts down that whole angle with his buddy, James Angleton, who was still in the CIA and running counterintelligence, who some people think was the mastermind of Kennedy's assassination. I do not. Um, some people think Dulles was. But again, the um, there was so there was there was that, and then there's C CYA stuff, right? Like, so let's say you recruited Oswald for an operation of any kind, you sure as heck don't want that out in the public that you were involved with him before Kennedy got killed, right? Um, so yes, I agree with you. So, so a lot of people refer to that as a quote unquote benign cover up. Uh, there are some things, very few though. I, th you know, I think it's very few of them that because they were weird and before the assassination, I think you can read more into, but the stuff that happened after a lot of it, in my opinion, was to stop world war three was to protect the sensitive operations like the anti-Castro plots and to preserve, prevent the government from being embarrassed by its interest in Oswald. Okay. Right. Okay. And in many cases, it becomes a snowball effect because, and this is not uncommon in a lot of other cases too. However benign your first, so-called benign, your first wave of covering things up is, over time, you actually have to cover up the cover up. Yeah, you have to you have to continue. Yeah, you do. You have to keep lying. It's like telling any lie. Yeah, it's you know, once a you snowball. Start, once you start lying, 
The moment people the, inquire, it, it, it becomes more and more lies to cover lies to cover lies. Right. Like you, you don't want people to know that you knew who may have killed Kennedy and you kept it to yourself. And so right. you so you so you lie about that. And then, you you know, again, as you said, it snowballs. And that's sort of the situation I think we're in now where we have this ridiculous situation where Trump and Biden basically ended our hopes of getting whatever, you know, it's not many, but what few files we have left. Um, okay. Um, you're working on, so you're not working on a book. You are, but you aren't working on a book. So I'm actually, once I get my life in gear, um, it's a couple major projects. I'm trying to, um, I, if I write a book, the next one is probably going to be about what my students did to pass that law. Okay. Um, and 60 Minutes is interested in that story. So I want to have something ready to go if they do, they run a story. Um, the, I'm also trying to create a nonprofit. Maybe I'll link, if you don't mind, to a GoFundMe for it. Um, yeah, to create, no to create a, um, nationwide program to get students involved at the high school level in the policy making process similar to what my students had done uh incredibly value you know valuable process to go through it took us years but everyone who went through it benefited from it um but eventually i do want to do jfk um, I have documentary material for my MLK stuff. And if you ever want me to do MLK with you, um, I'll, I could give you the link for that book. The, the two books that um, I have four total books. Um, three of them are co-written. One of the co-written is I'm a with, I barely did anything on it. One of them is um, called uh, the awful grace of God. That's the first book we did on the King assassination. The update of that book, which is the one I would get if I was in the public, would be Killing King. Uh, that's from 2018. There's a book called Shadow Warfare, which happens to has to deal with 50s, 60s covert military operations. I'm a with on that. All th and then uh, those three books were all done with my co-author, Larry Hancock. And then there's my solo book called America's Secret Jihad, and that's about the history of domestic terrorism, uh, especially domestic religious terrorism. And that, doing podcasts on, I've given congressional testimony about, um, but the King stuff, I'm trying, I, I have a lot of material for a documentary I need to finish some interviews and I really need AI to reach a point where I can do reenactments for free in 30 seconds clips. Once right. I get there, I could probably do half this myself with the way editing software is going. Right. Um, so that's my situation, but I would love to come on talk about anything. We didn't even talk about physical evidence and that's my other interest. Well, we'll, we, we will. Yeah. <laughs> we will do that um, at some point. Um, sure. Okay. Well, listen, I can put all the links in the description box. Okay. You know, uh, of if you send them to me. Absolutely. And, um, so, yeah, let me go ahead and, and, and wrap this up. Hold on. Give me one second. Sure. All right. Hold on. By the way, this was a, a great interview. What? I didn't say anything. That's, you know, sometimes that's the key to a really good interview. They're my best ones. Julian's very much the same way. Right. Um, but he, 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 like, you kept me focused. He's willing well, to let me uh, go virtually anywhere I bring something up. <laughs> He'll well, go to. I mean, it. It's, it's different it's, styles, but it's both great. Yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's always good when the, um, you know, when a guest like knows their story. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yes, some of yes. these guys I interview, like they've told their story once or twice of their buddies, but they don't really have a clear definition or, or you know, outline of what it is. And so they go all over the place and it's like, I get it. We're not at a party with your buddies. You know, it's like you need to kind of have your story laid out so that. 
you'd be stunned and slightly disturbed about how often I think about this case. Oh yeah. <laughs> then there, there's like a TikTok that was going around where uh, wives or something were asking men about like, how often do you think about the Roman empire? Yeah. And yeah. Did you see that? It's the Kennedy session. Right. Um, in recent years, I was diagnosed with OCD. Um, right. But not, I never understood that because I had always just thought OCD was like handling doorknobs like multiple times per day or making sure your stove's off. Right. But it can it could absolutely be obsessive compulsive thoughts. This anyone who knew me who knew that that was part of the diagnosis would be like Stu, you are OCD and JFK more than anything else would be what I would bring to a um a therapist to prove it to them if you had it that you have it because Let, I'm on the forums every day I think about it in the shower uh, I'm listen I'm the same way about two things uh World War II specifically the European theater mm -hmm. um and colonizing Mars very like it, interesting it's 80 percent of what I watch on YouTube interesting I could definitely sympathize with World War II. I mean, I was a modern American history teacher. Um, I do a lot of, I did a lot of simulations with my students where here's oh, the scenario. Would what would you do um, be before and after? Um, and then of course, saving private Ryan scenes and they don't get into it as much as I do. Like I was, I, I showed them, <laughs> I love showing them the, the, and I actually like the uh, the speech from the movie "The Darkest Hour" mm -hmm. with Gary Oldman better than the tape of of the the post because he wasn't his actual Churchill's actual tape, but the the audio recording of Churchill. Right. He doesn't have any verb in the in the you know recording. I'm sure he did it when he was in Parliament, but we don't have that recording. We only have the later one. Oldman's amazing. So I play them. You know. You know. You know. We'll we'll fight them on the beaches. We'll fight. Yeah, I go, I'm like, come on, like, you gotta be into that. And then I love showing them the scene from, uh, um, oh, what you call it? Um, what's the movie with, with the, with the plane at the end landing on the beach nominated for an Oscar about six years ago. Um, know. it's, it's all about, um, Dunkirk. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Dunkirk. Yeah, yeah, it's Dunkirk. It's I love, you know, presenting them, you know, you have to f solve the following problem. Your soldiers are stranded on the beach. The enemy's given them a window that they probably shouldn't have, but it's not going to last very long. And you don't have the resources in your Navy at this moment to go collect them. How the heck are you going? What the heck are you going to do to stop your military from being decimated on that beach? And nobody says they're all just throw up guesses that don't make any sense. And I say, this is how you get them back. And I show them the everyday people in fishing boats, yeah, putting their lives on the line to pick up the people at Dunkirk. And I get super into that, the heroism of it. Yeah, the, the, they don't get they nearly were, as stoked as I do. They are calling the miracle at Dunkirk. And then yeah, uh, and Churchill the, came out and said, Listen, you don't win wars through evacuations. Like, right. like it's yeah. great. I'm glad we great. got them back. Was that what it was? It was a huge mistake on the part of the Germans not to press their advantage. Yeah, yeah. What um, what what an opportunity wasted. Yeah, um, I showed them that, and then completely unrelated to World War II, I showed them the scene from Gettysburg, the Battle of Little Round Top. Hmm. Did you ever? What about? Do you like the? Uh, you said. Uh, uh, um, Saving Private Ryan, which is great. What about uh, Enemy at the Gate? I do not show them that, but I try and emphasize as much as humanly possible that the Russians did the vast majority of the fighting and dying. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad idea, though, because it does absolutely show the absolute depths of how terrible the war was. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like they were it's funny because I always rats. I always think of this. It's not true obviously, but I always think like, I think Hitler even said like, I, they're defeated. Like it's over. It wasn't over, but it's like the city isn't there anymore. <laughs> you're, you're beaten and they just 
no, we're not beaten. Everybody's dead practically. Like, what are yeah. you doing? Well, you have no food. You're starving. You're freezing. We're freezing. It's over. No. That's what's got to worry people about. Although I guess Ukraine could point to the same history, but <laughs> yeah, that's why you got to worry. You know, so they're getting their various periods, maybe not now, getting their ass kicked. But the one thing the Russians never do is give yeah. up. Right. Yeah, you can get a lot done when you're willing to just throw away. Mass, massacre, after. Your, you know, when you're a butcher, you know. Yeah. And just yeah. you're aiming to send every, you know, send prisoners to be cat and fodder. Oh, God, I love the, um, they even say it in there. It's like order, you know, 1157 or something where Stalin gives the order not one step backwards. And how yeah, they were, no. how they're handing, there's three people. You're, they're going in waves of like three guys. One has a rifle and a cartridge. The next guy has just a cartridge and the next guy has a cartridge. And they're saying, when he gets shot, you pick up the rifle, use your cartridge. When he gets shot, you pick up the rifle. It's like, yep. this is insanity. Yeah. And yet <laughs> they and yet pulled they, it yeah, off. They prevail. Yeah. They prevail. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, there's so many blunders in, uh, um, yeah. in that history of what, like, you know, why would you divert your military yeah, to, and the, to my, one of my that. favorites is on d-day uh um w hitler they won't wake up because he's sleeping Why, what are you talking <laughs> about and then um what's his face the um the tank commander is at a birthday party what's his name the most oh, famous yeah, yeah yeah um oh shoot he no yeah he, it's his wife's birthday yes yes um Oh gosh, I can picture him too. He's tall, thin. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was in North Africa, and somehow yeah. his name skips my mind. Yeah, it's not the Desert Fox. It's um, no, it is. It's Rommel. Oh, Rommel, thank you, Rommel. Yes. Okay, he was supposed um, to have been the 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 major like figure at that in the event of something like that. And of course, we fooled them with the fake army. And listen, I my poor wife. Bro, I feel so bad. Like I made her watch a whole thing. I'm like, they had blow up tanks. They made <laughs> fake airplanes, fake this. And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, it was like this complete ghost army. It's not yeah. even real. And I said, you know what? And then, then they put like, I like, I forget who it was, like Patton in charge of it. Yep, exactly. Because they would have that totally divert. It was brilliant. Yeah, you would never use Patton for a fake arm. It's got to be real. They put Patton in. <laughs> well, we did. But but do you, um, ever, do you ever see the picture? Is the the hilarious one where where Patton had told everybody that if I cross the, you know, if I, if I cross into Germany, I'm going to piss in the Rhine. Right. And nobody, everybody thought it was a joke, but there's actually a picture of Patton peeing oh, in the I, Rhine. I didn't know that. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, you could go see it. It's hilarious. Very um, Patton to do. Uh, uh, people think he was killed too. I don't quite go with that, but. Um. Yeah, I yeah, I was going to say I I the things that happen that are amazing during World War II are it's so over the top you're like you you watching you couldn't the, make it up. You couldn't make it up. It's like, wait a minute, you're telling me that Mussolini was overthrown. <laughs> he's placed in a prison. Hitler is upset about it, so he has paratroopers come down, fly down, land on the land on the uh, prison, bust well, him out, put him well, back in power to, to bring things full circle. And I brought this up to Julian, but it's a theory that I think has been too discredited in the last th three months to foist it. Um, and I'm, you'll probably be pissed at me for saying this. The, one of the most recent books has argued that the, the, the guy who did that operation, Otto scores any. Okay. Killed Kennedy. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I've no, that, that is, there is a whole book, and that is the main thesis, that he had gone to work for the CIA and other groups like the Israelis after the assassination, that he was actually the go-to guy in the world if you wanted to do this kind of stuff, which I actually don't necessarily disbelieve that. And then he got recruited by James Angleton and the CIA to basically – as part of some sort of quasi Fourth Reich thing, he he put together the King Kennedy assassination, um, and it's based on a diary written by a figure who um, 
And that's the problem. Um, who, without question, had very inter one of the most colorful lives you've ever heard. His name is Pierre Lafitte. All sorts of connections to the intelligence community. But the problem is, is that guy, by the admission of the authors themselves, was like all time Hall of Fame con man. Right. And the problem in the Kennedy assassination is we have a gillion examples of con men trying to claim that they had something to do with planning the Kennedy assassination, who we know are full of crap. And this guy is dead and it would be a little bit more elaborate than a lot of other hoaxes. But I think what this probably was, was he was planning a big time hoax to make money and he just died before it materialized. And this author stumbled upon him because of his other connections to other weird events. And the family provided the author with the bogus diary. And of course, if you're that author, you're going to be like, no way that this could be planned because you're not thinking that way. But it's just, there's too much wrong with it. I mean, like the diary itself has got like an iron cross on it or something. Like that's kind of crazy, melodramatic nonsense that, you um, know. I was going to say, if you, did you ever hear about the, the theory? Obviously, I'm sure you've heard this. Everybody's heard this, that um, Hitler actually escaped the bunker and went to Venezuela. So did you see that History Channel documentary, yeah. Hunting Hitler? Yes. Yes, I've yes. seen it. I thought that was actually pretty well done, but I wound up emerging from that thinking to myself, I don't think there's any chance Hitler's alive, but they made a pretty decent case that maybe Martin Bormann faked his death and got out of there. Um, That was pretty impressive. The same people did a Kennedy assassination special um, later, and it made me want to question their their Nazi one only because – they were constantly presenting uh, things as if they were like these, oh my gosh, that's crazy. That's brand new. And I'm like, dude, I wrote a high school report on that in 1993. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so they they wound up um, implying it could have been Castro, even though – they did, they did do some inter, they did a very interesting they were able to take government documents and scan them into a system that was able to interpret geolocation on a map so what they were able to do was do like a they were able to search for those people i was talking to you about in Dallas the exiles mm mm-hmm. mhm like people who had gone to Harlandale. And they were able to show very interestingly that like all of them lived on houses on Oswald's bus route if he had been able to get on the bus to escape from Dallas. Right. But I'm sitting there going, then how does that lead to Castro? And they were trying to make it out as if, oh, well, Castro has a lot of, informants in the exile community and that's how he did it he used doubles and there's a part of that which is true he had infiltrated those guys out the wazoo right but there's no evidence that the people that been implicated in this case beyond that stuff i told you about with like carl jenkins and stuff like those guys would have had to have been the greatest doubles of all time because they were doing anti-communist stuff in 1985 Right. Um, you know, it's an awful long time to hang out and, and pretend you're working for the, you know, Americans. Right. Yeah, you're yeah, they're taking it to the extreme. Yeah. So uh yeah, that um and that show wasn't nearly as well done. But they did get to people in Mexico and I wish people would could get back to them again. Like the people at the embassy and the consulate. There's a story there that needs to be told that's incredibly confusing beyond the one I'm telling. Because if I had gone into the story on how weird, why people think it wasn't really even Oswald in the flesh, I have to be honest, there are times where I actually 
dabble in that thought. It's so freaking weird. Yeah. Well, you know, the problem with most people is that they're, they have a limited, you know, um, you know bandwidth. Uh, yeah, exactly. Their interest is, and, and the more confusing it gets, it's like, okay, that's why typically, you know, obviously Hollywood simplifies stories. Oh yeah. You know, they have to be stream, you know, stream, uh, lined for people to follow that basic story that's told over and over again. Yeah. I was doing my darndest by keeping it chronological and yeah. geographical um, and trying to remind people of the stuff before. But yeah, it absolutely gets to be a, a confusing complicated yeah, yeah. situation. Hey, if you like the interview, do me a favor. I'm going to put all of Stu's uh, links in the description box. So click on the links to his books. And also do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos like this. A lot of people don't get notified. Sometimes just turning off the bell and then turning it back on might help. Also, um, I would really appreciate it if you guys would consider joining my Patreon. Thank you very much uh, for watching the video and leave me a comment in the comment section and please share the video. Thank you guys. See ya.